Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Spokane City Council Legislative Agenda. If you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we have another episode of Poetry at the Podium. And thanks to Spokane Arts for uh, organizing this. I'd like to invite up Liz Marlin from the West Central to read Squad Cart 222. Liz is here or this online? This is virtual. Roll call. Oh, before you speak, Liz, we're going to do a roll call. Council President Biggs. Present. Council Member Bingle. Here. Council Member Cathcart. Present. Council Member Kinnear. Present. Council Member Stratton. Here. Council Member Wilkerson. Present. Council Member Zapone. Here. Let the record reflect that all council members are present. All right. Liz, we're ready for you. Let's see. We're not hearing you. Liz, we can't hear you if you're speaking. Let's maybe do the proclamation noise. She's in the, in the meeting. It's a little odd. So. All right. Liz, we're going to come back to you. First, we're going to do a proclamation on Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month. Councilmember Bingle, and I believe KD Langan is here uh, virtually. Yeah, this one's uh, near and dear to my heart. I just had a friend's family uh, tragically lose their uh, to baby to SIDS. Um, whereas many parents and families across the United States are devastated each year by the loss of their child to stillbirth, miscarriage, SIDS, or any other cause at any point during pregnancy or infancy. And whereas in 1988, U United States President Ronald Reagan declared October as National Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month to recognize the unique grief of bereaved parents in an effort to demonstrate support to the many families who have suffered such a tragic loss. And whereas promoting awareness of pregnancy and infant loss not only increases the likelihood that grieving families will receive understanding and support, but also results in improved education and prevention efforts, which may ultimately reduce the incidence of these tragedies. Now, therefore, I, Nadine Woodward, mayor of the city of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, to hereby proclaim October 22 as Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month in Spokane, and in remembrance of Colton D. Langen, encourage parents, caregivers, and all residents to become educated in opportunities to prevent pregnancy and infant loss and support bereaved families when prevention is not possible. All right, Katie, if you'd like to say a few words, welcome to Spokane City Council. I thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate this. This gives us a platform to acknowledge that our babies did exist. No matter how far along we were, may it be a couple weeks. So a couple of months. A couple of Colton passed away at the Aberdeen this Wednesday, in fact. His twin brother, survivor, Carson Langan, is... ...doing amazing, but I want to make sure that... ...support. We appreciate our people. Thank you. Katie, thank you for being here and sharing your heartbreak as well. And we support you and all the people who've been in your shoes. Thanks for speaking for all of them. Um, take care. We'll send a copy of that proclamation. Thank you.
And we'll go back to Liz, Marlon, see if we can get you on screen, Liz. Liz, we can't hear you. Um, if you're unmuted. All right, Liz, I don't know if you can hear us, but I think we're going to have to um, move you to another night. We really want to hear your poem, um, but we're not able to connect with you. All right, so let's uh, move on then to the consent agenda. And if you want to go ahead and read that, we want to take um, numbers 4 and 11 separately. Okay. Reports, contracts, and claims. Number one, Spokane Airport Board 2023 budget. Number two, value blanket renewal and specialty asphalt products. Spokane for the purchase of SA Premier crack sealant utilizing Washington State contract number 01211, not to exceed $125,000. Number three, five-year value blanket with M&L Supply Company Incorporated. Spokane for an as-needed purchases of backflow prevention assemblies. Estimated annual amount, $250,000, including tax. Item number four will be considered separately. Number five, multiple family housing property tax exemption conditional agreements with A. Finley O. and Susan M. Gillespie for the future construction of approximately nine units at parcel number 3508.12407, commonly known as 80, 2813 North Dakota Street. B. Macklemore on Sprague LLC for the future construction of approximately 16 units at parcel numbers 35212.0406 and 35212.0408, commonly known as 1924 East Sprague Avenue and 14 South Napa. C, East Magnesium Properties, LLC, for future construction of approximately 504 units at parcel number 3620.1.0016, commonly known as 849 East Magnesium Avenue. D, Mission One Properties, LLC, for the future construction of approximately 16 units at parcel numbers 35162.0501, 2.0505, commonly known as 1608 East Mission Avenue. E, A Better Way, JJJ, LLC, for the future construction of approximately four units at parcel number 35211.3306, commonly known as 2801 East 5th Avenue. F, John Mil Milne, for the future construction of approximately 10 units at parcel number 35331.0352, commonly known as 2014 East 31st Avenue. G, E, Central Community Organization, for the future construction of approximately four units at parcel number 35212.3415, commonly known as 813 East 4th Avenue. The conditional agreements will ultimately result in the issuance of a final certificate of tax exemption to be filed with the Spokane County Assessor's Office post-construction. Number six, low bid of Hallmay Construction Incorporated Spokane for Nevada Joseph Pedestrian Hybrid Beacon and Bemis Elementary Walk Route Improvements Project, $836,106, including tax and administrative reserve of 10% of the contract price will be set aside. Number seven, contract with David Evans and Associates Incorporated Spokane for the design of the Maple Street Bridge Deck Rehabilitation, $288,527 plus a 10% administrative reserve. Number eight, contract with KPFF Consulting Engineers Incorporated Seattle, Washington for the design of the Washington Stevens Bridge Deck Rehabilitation, $297,094.76 plus a 10% administrative reserve. Number nine, contract amendment with GHD Incorporated Seattle, Washington to develop future infrastructure concept designs and costs associated with the city of Spokane, continuing to provide the city of Airway Heights with water service, $87,884.72 87, plus applicable tax. Number 10, agreement amendment two with Gecko Incorporated doing business as live stories now forward for additional reallocation award of $218,121.99 in ERA 1.0 funds, $218,121.99 relates to special budget ordinance C36300. Number 11 will be considered separately. Number 12, report of the mayor of pending A claims and payments of previously approved obligations, including those of parks and library through October 14, 2022. Total $6,700,915.79 with parks and library claims. Approve of the respective boards. Warrants excluding parks and library. Total $5,921,549.53. B, payroll claims of previously approved obligations through October 15, 2022. 
$9,840,850.04. Number 13, City Council meeting minutes for October 10, 2022. Number 14, pre-approval of purchase for Ford F-250 or similar, similar diesel crew cab four-wheel drive pickup trucks and three Chevrolet Tahoe GMC Yukon or similar di diesel all-wheel drive sport utility vehicles for the fire department, $515,000. Item number 15, letter of agreement between the City and International Association of Firefighters, Local 29, regarding emergency transition to Shrek and severance coverage of employee wages and benefits. Number 16, interlocal agreement for fire dispatch services between City of Spokane and Spokane Regional Emergency Communications. I'd like to take 16 separate. Okay. We'll uh, not take 16 for this as well. We have uh, one person who's uh, signed up for public comment. That's Christine Lowe, L-O-E. And I think Christine is appearing by phone. So if you want to hit star three on your phone, Christine. All right. Christine, welcome to Spokane City Council. You have up to three minutes. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Hi, my name is Chrissy Lowe. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a homeowner in West Central. I'm calling in today to ask City Council to please stop the division of our neighborhoods. I understand the council is here to discuss City Council boundaries, including Map 1 and Map 2. Christine? I believe vital pieces of information Christine? are being left out of this conversation. Christine, yes? I'm going to interrupt you. So yes. you, you signed up for the consent agenda, but that is not on the consent agenda. That's going to be later in the meeting. We'll put you... We'll sign you up for that one, um, but that's the consent agenda was just the things that uh, Ms. Fister just read. So I'm going to stop you now because other people who signed up to speak on the same topic, we're going to group you all at once. So okay, um, awesome. So just hang on. The the bad news is it's going to be a little while, yeah. but um, yeah. but hopefully not too long, and uh, we'll sign you up for that. So please stay tuned, and we'll get you to that. Thank you. All right, that was the only uh, comment. I did just wanted to note for the record, uh, well over 500 units uh, under the uh, MFTE, so that program is working great, and also wanted to note a lot of money for uh, traffic calming in the neighborhoods. But all those in favor of uh, everything on the consent agenda except for 11 and 16, indicate by saying aye. And four. Four. And four. 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 I th thought I said four, but four, 11, and 16. Uh, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Any abstentions? Okay. Then let's go first to um, matter four. Personal services agreement with Spokane Arts to manage the residential street, mural, and community crosswalks programs from September 1, 2022 through December 31, 2025 in cooperation with the Street Department and Office of Neighborhood Services, $972,750 excluding tax. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Nay. Uh, abstentions. All right. That's five to two in favor. Let's go to um, number 11. And Councilmember Wilkerson, I think you are abstaining from that one. I am abstaining from that vote as I am the board chair of the Carl Maxey Center. Okay. All those in favor, indicate by saying did, aye. Did you uh, want aye. me to read it first? Oh, oh. yes. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Item number 11, Award of Additional Eviction Rent Assistance Program, ERAP 2.0 funds received from the Department of Commerce to the following to prevent evictions by paying rental arrears, current and future rent and other costs. A, Carl Maxey Center, $242,082. B, Family Promise, $264,089. And C, Live Stories Now Forward, $1,132,716. Relates to Special Budget Ordinance, C36301. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Any abstentions? Councilmember Wilkerson. Okay, that passes. And then item number 16. Item 16, interlocal agreement for fire dispatch services between City of Spokane and Spokane Regional Emergency Communications. Uh, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Nay. Any abstentions? All right, that passes six to one. All right, and I believe we might have Liz Marlin back on for poetry. Liz, are you there? Liz, we're not hearing you. Okay. 
All right, I guess we're not going to get you tonight. Um, let's move on to special budget ordinances. Ordinance C36300, amending ordinance number C36161, passed by the City Council of December 13, 2021, and entitled an ordinance adopting the annual budget of the City of Spokane for 2022, making appropriations to the various funds of the City of Spokane government for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2022, and providing it shall take effect immediately upon passage and declared an emergency and appropriating funds in. Ordinance C36300, Emergency Rental Assistance Fund, number one, increased revenue by $218,122. A of the increased revenue, $218,122, is provided to the City of Spokane for the Emergency Rental Assistance ERA 1.0 reallocation from the U.S. Department of the Treasury. Number two, increased appropriation by $218,122. A of the increased appropriation, $218,122, is provided solely for contractual services provided by subrecipients that are responsible for distributing rental assistance funds. This action arises from the additional funding awarded to the city through the U.S. Department of the Treasury's ERA 1.0 reallocation process. There's nobody signed up for community comment. Is there any council commentary? All right, prepare to vote. All right, that passes seven to zero. Next. Ordinance C36301, Human Services Grants Fund. Number one, increased revenue by $1,725,144. A of the increased revenue, $1,725,144, is provided to the City of Spokane for the Eviction Rent Assistance Program, ERAP. 2.0 grant from the Washington State Department of Commerce. Number two, increased appropriation by $1,725,144. A of the increased appropriation, $1,638,887 is provided solely for contractual services provided by subrecipients that are responsible for distributing rental assistance funds. B of the increased appropriation, $86,257 is provided solely for the city's administration of ERAP 2.0. This action arises from the additional funding awarded to the City of Spokane from the Washington State Department of Commerce through the Emergency Rent Assistance Program 2.0. All right, nobody from the community has signed up for this one. Is there any council testimony? All right, prepare to vote. All right, that also passes 7 to 0. And um, I'll have you read this in a second, but just as a preview, this has been amended pretty significantly to only pay for the uh, final payments on a relocation of the engineering office and not the vehicles. But go ahead and read it as okay. it's been amended. Ordinance C36282 as amended, general fund number one, de decrease the appropriation for a senior engineer position, including benefits, by $102,000. Number two, increase the appropriation for a relocation retainage payment by $102,000. A, there is no change to the overall appropriation level in the general fund. This action arises from the need to pay the last retainage bill for the construction management building. All right, prepare to vote. All right, we'll try again. <laughs> prepare to vote. All right, that passes seven to zero. All right, next one. Ordinance C36284, Criminal Justice Assistance Fund, number one, increase appropriation by $100,000. A of the increased appropriation, $100,000 is provided solely as a transfer out to the Office of Performance Management Department. An Office of Performance Management Fund, number one, increased revenue by $100,000. B of the increased revenue, $100,000 is provided solely as a transfer in from the Criminal Justice Assistance Fund, number two, increase appropriation by $100,000. C, of the increased appropriation, $100,000 is provided solely for contractual services. This action arises from the need to provide full-time senior level project management expertise to the Community Safety Initiative. All right, there's no community comment on this. Any council commentary? All right, I will just give my commentary that this is a rate of $200,000 a year, and I would much prefer that we hired a project employee to work with this that would stay with it. But um, with that, prepare to vote. All right, 
as four to three, but for a special budget ordinance, it requires five, so that fails at this time. Hopefully, we'll work with the administration and figure that out, like some kind of compromise. All right, that brings us to emergency ordinances. Excuse me, did you wish to consider the special oh, budget yes. ordinance? Yes, thank you so much. So, council members, you have another special budget ordinance in front of you. Uh, C36303, which the clerk will read briefly. This is a special budget ordinance that funded uh, our consent item with the uh, letter approval agreement with uh, Local 29 on transitioning our fire dispatch. This was supposed to have been filed and was not really brought to our attention until after our briefing session today. Uh, so first, I'm looking for a motion to add C36303 to our agenda this evening. So move addition. Uh, is there a second? Second. Okay, there's a second. Um, and I'll have the clerk read it and then I'll ask anyone in the public if they want to testify and then we'll go to council testimony. Did you want to take a vote first to add it? Oh, sure. sorry. <laughs> Those in favor of adding, any commentary on adding? Yes, Councilor yeah. Cathcart. I, I guess I'm just wondering, is it crucial that this is voted on today given the lack of time to really digest it? If there's anyone from the administration, uh, Mr. Piccolo from City Legal and also Acting HR Director. Yeah, this item was in the packet for the pies committee unfortunately the bullet points were merged together so it said one bullet point letter of agreement and SBO and that was not brought out separately so the item should have been taken separately as a separate bullet item and the should have been added into the packet but so. the, the content here is the same as what was in the packet yes okay yeah Thank and you. this item is necessary to fund the letter of agreement and and the uh, severance package for those employees okay so thank you very much for Special consideration in taking this on. Any other commentary on the motion to add to the agenda? All right, all those in favor of adding, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Any abstentions? All right, it's added to the agenda. And Ms. Fister, if you could please read it, and then we'll see if there's any public testimony requests. Ordinance number C36303, an ordinance amending ordinance number C36161 passed the City Council December 13, 2021, and entitled an ordinance adopting the annual budget of the City of Spokane for 2022, making appropriations to the various funds of the City of Spokane government for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2022, and providing it shall take effect immediately upon passage and declaring an emergency. Whereas subsequent to the adoption of the 2022 budget ordinance number C36161 is above entitled and which passed the City Council December 13, 2021, it is necessary to make changes in the appropriations of the Combined Communication Center Fund, which changes could not have been anticipated or known at the time of making such budget ordinance. And whereas this ordinance has been on file in City Clerk's Office for five days, now therefore the City of Spokane does ordain Section 1 that in the budget of the Combined Communication Center Fund and the budget annexed thereto with reference to the fund, the following changes be made. Number one, increase appropriation by $460,000. Of the increased appropriation, $157,000 is provided solely for salaries and wages and personnel benefits. B, of the increased appropriation, $303,000 is provided solely for contractual services. Section two, it is therefore by the City Council declared that an urgency and emergency it exists for making the changes set forth herein. Such urgency and emergency arising from the need to pay non-uniform fire dispatchers for early transition to Spokane Regional Emergency Communications, Shrek and to pay Shrek for two months of services and because of such need and, ur and urgency and emergency exists for the passage of this ordinance. And also because the same makes an appropriation it shall take effect and be enforced immediately upon its passage. And just by way of background, for many years, the city of Spokane has handled its own fire dispatch services. And um, the administration has requested that we transition that to uh, the county's uh, program. And in order to do that, it will cost us money for the next two months on an interim basis. And also we need to pay the people who are union members who've been working in that uh, for the transition that's going on since they're losing their uh, positions that's traditional city work. So that's what's going on behind the scenes on that. But that said, is there anyone in the public who wants to testify about that? If you do, if you raise your hand. 
Not seeing anyone. Any council commentary? Council Member Bingle. Yeah, um, just quickly, um, requested by administration and also approved by the union for this transition to take place. Yep, the, the, the compensation part was approved by the union, yep. Council Member Stratton. I just wanted to publicly um, say that while I don't support the transition to Shrek, I do support um, some of the, the um, salaries and wages and benefits that will be going to our Spokane Fire Department dispatchers who um, have been affected by this. So I will support this, but I pub publicly wanted to say I I'm very torn on it. All right. Any other council commentary? All right. Prepare to vote. All right, that passes seven to zero. Before we get to resolutions and final ordinances, I just want to note we have a lot of people signed up for testimony uh, going forward. Uh, Ms. Allers tells me that we have about three hours of testimony, not counting open forum, right? Or did that count open forum? It's going to be around there no matter what, yeah. Okay, so the only reason I say that is that we have a council rule that ends testimony at 930 unless council extends it. And so if you're if you're here, the only reason you're here is for open forum. There is some chance that we might not get to you tonight. Um, so I just wanted to give you fair warning. We'll uh, see where we are at 930. And sometimes council extends if there's just one or two people left. But just wanted to let people know that ahead of time. Um, so with that, let's go to resolutions and final reading of ordinances. Did you want to do the, are we doing the emergency ordinances later? No, oh, no, nope, we're not, sorry. We're, sorry. Doing, we're doing emergency ordinances <laughs> first. Ordinance C36296, amending interim zoning ordinance number C36232 and amending Spokane Municipal Code section 17C.400.010 and 17C.400.030 to clarify requirements for airport overlay zones and the siting parking facilities in relation to streets and residential structures and declaring an, emer and declaring an emergency. And this again, just by way of preview, are some minor uh, changes to what we passed earlier this year, allowing uh, duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes. A little bit of language that the planning department has asked that we just finalize again on this interim uh, pilot project while they're working on final ordinances. So. I don't think it's too controversial, but, and we have no public comment. Any uh, council commentary? All right, prepare to vote. All right, passes seven to zero. Ordinance C36297 relating to fire and police dis Dispatch service personnel amending Spokane Municipal Code sections 3.10.070 and 3.12.010 and declaring an emergency. All right, this is also related to the uh, fire and police dispatch. Uh, we currently have a law in the books that says only city employees can do that work. And this would amend that to allow us to contract with uh, the county's services to do that under some conditions that they'd have to add uh, two seats to the governing board to the city, including one appointed by the city council, and also uh, access to uh, copies of audio files so that we can do quality control and also that they provide regular reports on their performance in terms of how long it takes to, from the time they get a call to the time they do dispatch. There's no public comment. Is there any community, excuse me, any council member comment? All right, prepare to vote. All right, that's six to one, which passes. And now we'll go to resolutions and final reading ordinances. Resolution 2022-91, approving the Plan Commission's 2022-2023 work program. And again, we don't have any community comment on this. Any council commentary? All right, prepare to vote. All right, that passes seven to zero. Brings us to the next resolution. 
Resolution 2022-92, recognizing and accepting the Division Connect study. Hereafter, the study as a declaration of the city's desired future transportation and land use conditions within the Division Street corridor from downtown Spokane North to the Spokane City limits. All right, there's no community comment requested. Any council commentary? Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Um, yeah, I'll be supporting this tonight, but uh, just a couple of things. You know, I just, I worry a little um, in terms of the timeline between when we'll be starting the, the construction and, and the changes along the Division Street corridor versus when something like the North-South Freeway is gonna be completed, because I think the two of them are kind of symbiotic in how they have to work uh, hand in glove. You know, the idea is that we're gonna move a lot of the freight traffic off of Division over to the North-South Freeway. And so a lot of this is dependent upon, you know, no more delays on the North-South Freeway. Uh, I just found out last week that what we were expecting was that the Wellesley um, section would be open in spring next year. Now we're told it's gonna be the end of next year. So, you know, we're continuing to see that slow delay of, of these projects. And so I just wanna make sure um, that I kind of voice my concerns that, you know, we need to make sure that the timelines work uh, that we're constantly monitoring the traffic counts um, just to make sure there's no unintended consequences creating mass congestion where we don't want it. Division is already a pretty congested um, area. And so those are my concerns. I just wanna voice those out loud for folks to hear because um, I am gonna vote for this because I do think that there's a lot of positives that can come from this as long as the process to get there is done correctly. So I'll leave it there. Council member Wilkerson and then Kinnear. Well, I'll be voting for this for one reason. Not only did our city planners work on this, but the STA planners worked on this. The Spokane Regional Transportation Board Committee worked on this, and they all came together with a more holistic approach for division as our community grows. So with that type of input, uh, subject matter experts, I'll be supporting this as well. All right, Councilmember Kinnear. And I will add, uh, when we first started discussion on this, I was on the SRTC board, and I voiced the same concerns you have, Mr. Cathcart, and I was told by WashDOT, we're about two years too late. We should have started this planning two years ago, because you don't just whip up a plan and a design and build it. So there are a lot of steps that are going to happen between us approving this and things actually getting going. So we have a lot of time, and we're, we're already two years behind. Councilmember Bingle. Um, along the same lines everybody's talking about, the thing that, that gives me pause more than anything is the completion of the North-South Freeway because the delays that have happened, I mean, it feels like my entire life we've been talking about the North-South Freeway. It was proposed before my mom was born. It's still not completed. Uh, and so for me, if, if that's not completed by the time changes here happen, I think we're gonna see significant irritation um, in, in the commute and people doing it. And so um, I'm, I'm honestly just still not sure where I'm at on this. I, I appreciate all the hard work of our, of our planners. I appreciate um, all the people and, um, and the effort that's gone into this, but uh, I, I have concerns that the, that the North-South Corridor is not gonna be completed um, by the time this actually gets implemented because, you know, that project has been delayed so many different times. And our, our more, most recent change in timeline has been move up, and I'm thankful for that. I, I have real concerns that it gets moved back again for a number of reasons. All right. Yeah, I'll concur. I think I came to Spokane in 1981. I'm not sure exactly when you were born. That might have been before. And we were, uh, yeah, we were, uh, we were uh, talking North-South Freeway back then, and uh, apparently have been for decades before that. So there is, I have some fear that it will be long enough that it will become the world's uh, biggest and most expensive bicycle path because we won't have any oil left uh, uh, there. But uh, one thing I just want to note, I'm super excited about the North-South Freeway is coming. It has its detractors and its fans, but this is really going to be a bonus for all of us because it means we can re-envision uh, division uh, to both have traffic go through it and a dedicated bus lane down the middle of it. But we also are going to get protected bike lanes, which just imagine, and I was not a, a lifetime bicycle commuter or cyclist, uh, but I did have a chance to take a trip to um, uh, Denmark and see how they use bicycle commuting there. And I'm just imagining uh, bicycles protected, so that means kids and anyone of any ability can go all the, right down the vision to downtown. And I just think that's going to be a huge change 
uh, and it's really going to allow way more housing along division with transit and bicycling, and uh, it's gonna be very exciting. So I'm supportive of this as well. Uh, if you can prepare to vote. Six to one. Next. Resolution 2022-93, authorizing City Cable 5 to purchase and operate a broadcast quality drone to, to produce programs and marketing for the City of Spokane. All right, there's no community commentary. Any council commentary? Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, just real quick. I think anything we can do to expand the scope of City Cable 5 is really important. Uh, I think it draws more interest into watching our meetings, which for a lot of people can be a snooze. So uh, totally understand that, but we want as many folks engaged, watching, observing. Uh, and so I think that investments like this make sense, uh, and there's a lot more that I, I would do, but uh, this is a good start, and I think it'll add just a little bit more high-quality production to what we're trying to do to get more people watching what we're doing. All right. And I'll just note for those of you who are watching of like why are we uh, voting, whether someone can add a drone. Uh, long before most of us, if not all of us on council, the city passed a law that says if the city's going to be doing surveillance when drones it needs to come to council just for a quick approval. This seems like a good thing. So that's what's going on. All those in favor, or, or Sorry. go ahead. Oh, real quick. Go ahead. Do you want to speak on that a little bit more as to why that was a concern, the surveillance as the drone is in the air? Well, it was before my time, but there was a, but there was a time that uh, people were concerned about big government and really wanting to make sure that, uh, contrary to some of the things that happened at the federal level, mm -hmm. that we know when we're surveilling, when government is surveilling right. us. Yeah, it, yeah it, was a, it was a privacy concern, but this is something that, again, is just going to be used uh, for marketing purposes, and so it's going to be yeah. a good thing. Yeah. Council member. And Stratton. Betsy and I can add that John DeLay and his staff worked with federal aviation, with the Spokane International Airport folks to make sure they were following all the guidelines and so we should be good on this. They put a lot of work into it. Yes, they yeah. did. Awesome. All right, prepare to vote. All right, next resolution. Resolution 2022-95, approving payment of self-insured retention in the matter of estate of David Novak et al. versus City of Spokane et al. Cause number 21-2-00037-32, $450,535.14. All right, we have uh, one request for public comment, and that's Anwar Peace. Mr. Peace, if you want to come up. Good evening. My name is Anwar Peace, a Spokane resident and a 22-year police accountability expert. I support the settlement on the wrongful death lawsuit of David Novak by Spokane police officers on um, to, uh, January 7, 2019. The city has now finally admitted the death of David Novak should never have happened and that this large settlement can start to give David's family some sense of peace of mind and some justice over the loss of their loved one at the hands of police. The settlement with David's family allows them to finally be able to work through their grieving process outside the public eye, which the family hasn't been able to do up until this po point. Here's a bit of who David was and what he meant to our community. David Novak grew, grew up in the family home in Nine Mile. As a teen, teen if he wasn't helping his mom fix up their house. He was on the lake swimming or water skiing. David was also an athlete competing in gymnastics, baseball, and football. He attended Nine Mile until his senior year, which he finished at Hammer Mill Alternative School. David mostly worked construction jobs and spent his vacations time in Maui, where he developed a solid group of friends. Before his death, David was just one flight hour away from getting his helicopter pilot's license. After some heart issues, made him leave construction, David began setting up his own trucking business. His doctor sent an email the morning after his death clearing David to drive commercially. David's English bulldog, Gracie, was always by his side, even up to the moment he died. David always made time for his family, showering his nieces and nephews with big bear hugs and spent a lot of time with his grandma. Sadly, 
His grandma was unable to see justice happen to David's case before her death, even though the, the family is relieved that David is with his grandma in heaven together hanging out. So let me be clear on this. I never knew David Novak, and I really wish I had. Even though I didn't know David, David I deeply love David, as well as I deeply miss not having him in our community. David Novak did not deserve to die at the hands of police, and yet, sadly, SPD has still been pushing out to the public a false narrative about David's death. I would encourage the council to approve this settlement and then finally go forward with the council's uh, police reform package from a few years ago while going forward with phase two of the police reform roundtable meetings. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Anwar. And I just want to note, if you're looking at the... Uh, agenda the way it's published it says approving settlement it's actually approving the payment and that's because the payment the city's going to make is four hundred fifty thousand dollars and a little more money but the settlement was four million dollars in case that was confusing to folks um, we don't have any other public comment is there any council commentary council member Bingham? I'll just quickly say if people are wondering why it's not the full four million dollars we have uh, a liability of one and a half million and we have insurance that pays um, up above and beyond that. So the city will have paid one and a half million dollars in total on this um, while the settlement was four million. Yep. All right, prepare to vote. All right, that passes seven to zero. Next. Ordinance C-36-275, vacating the alley between Everett Avenue and vacated Sanson Avenue from the east line of Julia Street to the west line of Myrtle Street. First reading held September 19, 2022. All right. And is Eldon here? If you, if you want to give us a preview of what's going on here. Good evening. We had the first reading of this vacation on September 19th. It was approved subject to conditions. We really only had one condition, which was reserving an easement over the, let me see if I can pull it up here a little bit better. We reserved an easement over the west 130 feet of that vacation, basically at Julia Street, 130 feet to the east. Uh, that was the only condition we had. There was no city utilities in that alley, so it was, good for vacation and you can see it's also been vacated on both sides already so it's not like we're taking anything out of the middle of anything so I'd be happy to answer any questions we're just here for final reading any questions for Eldon all right there's no community comment is there any council commentary all right thank you as always Eldon prepare Thanks. to vote all right that passes seven to zero all right, um, I'm going to move uh, slightly out of order and go to hearings because we have one community member ready to testify about that. If you go to hearing number one. H1, public hearing before city council for possible revenue sources for the 2023 budget. All right, so under state law, we have to have a hearing about what we're doing on um, tax revenues and this ordinance. Uh, details what we're doing, some of the existing levies that we have. And the one person that signed up is Gary Did Den. You want to do the presentation? Oh, sure. Is there someone here to present? No. Come on down. You can just open whatever you need. You don't need to share your screen or anything but we do want you to talk into the mic. So you can move the mouse. Not, or you not the other one. That one's not as good. Okay. But you can move the mouse. Yeah. All right, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Thank you, Council. Uh, my name is Jacob Miller. I'm a budget analyst here at the city, and uh, I'll be discussing possible revenue sources for the 2023 proposed budget. 
I'll start by looking at the upcoming hearing dates and then other key dates uh, in addition to that. And then we'll look at the general fund from a high level, an overview of those revenues, and then we'll dig, at, dig into the details a bit further from there. So by law, uh, the mayor's proposed budget is required to be released by November 2nd. We still intend on releasing it November 1st, but there is a hard deadline for us the day following. We have five budget hearings where the public can comment on the budget, uh, ranging from November 7th through December 5th. And then other key dates upcoming, we have a property tax ordinance that we owe an updated version of to the council. And then we also have the CIP ordinance, uh, the capital improvement program ordinance on November 14th. So we'll move right into the, the information about revenues. Here you can see we have several taxes broken out in the general fund revenue pool, uh, property, sales, and the two uh, utility taxes. And then we have a large other category that I'll break down further on the next slide. In total, the 2022 adopted budget was 216.8 million and the, our proposed budget has 224.8 million, so an increase of 8 million. So collapsing all those taxes into a single line, you see it's a vast majority of our general fund revenues at 186.6 million, or 83% of that total. Breaking apart that other category, we have licenses and permits, that's business licenses, franchising fees, uh, with a slight increase of about 300,000, up to 7.1 from the 2022 adopted budget. Intergovernmental revenues uh, include grants, federal and state, uh, and also liquor um, board, ta or just profits essentially that the state distributes to us, uh, along with marijuana taxes. Uh, below that, we have charges for services with a very slight increase. Uh, those services are law enforcement services, um, court and legal services as well that we provide. Fines and forfeitures, we're reducing the budget back down to the 2021 actuals range, which uh, is primarily due to the infractions, the traffic infractions. Uh, we need to reduce that budget back down. Uh, miscellaneous revenue is primarily our interest earnings, so we're anticipating uh, an increase in that just given interest rates rising right now. And then other revenues are mostly just transfers in from other funds into the general fund. So looking at the details of, of this, uh, we'll start with property taxes. So by law, governments can choose to increase property taxes by 1% each year or the inflation rate if it happens to be lower than 1%. In this case, uh, last year was 4.7% inflation, so we would hit that one. We would have the 1% increase available to us. Local governments that forego that 1% in a given year would bank that capacity for future years to use it whenever they need to. Uh, the mayor's proposed budget will not include that 1% increase, um, so this presentation will reflect that, so everything I present will assume that. Can you uh, tell us what that 1% would have been about? Yeah, yeah I'll go into it on will the, you? Okay. Or, yeah, right. actually, let's do this. So the 1% increase wasn't available on all of the levies, and I'll, I'll discuss why in a little bit, but ultimately for the general fund, that would have been a difference of 477,000, um, and then distributed from our regular levy into fire pensions and streets, and then also the public safety would lift and the other funds. So, And I read somewhere that was going to be like for a $400,000 house, it'd be like Eight dollars a year. Definitely, and I'll, yeah, I'll show that explicitly through okay, the great. yeah in the PowerPoint. Thanks. So, yep. Okay, so on this chart, you'll see on the left side, I have a list of all of our uh, current levies, and then next to that, I have 2022 and 2023 values uh, for the levy rate uh, per one thousand dollars of assessed value. And then to the right of that, that's the levy itself uh, that the city expects to bring in. So I'm highlighting two sections here, uh, and really the total line applies as well. But you'll see in 2022, the levy rate was 2.47 for the regular levy. And in 2023, it's 
the, the reason for that is the drastic increase in assessed value in the city. So it's increased by approximately 30% uh, from 26.3 billion in 2021 to 33.7 billion in 2022. So the levy rate goes down, but the assessed values go up and they offset each other essentially with a slight increase. Uh, so that we're expecting to bring in uh, in total 90.2 million or nine, there was 90.2 90, 90 million in 2022 and this year or in 23 we're expecting 99.3 primarily responsible is the EMS le levy the other item I have highlighted there you'll see in 22 it was 35.8 cents per thousand dollars and in 2023 that's increased to 50 cents in April of 2022, the voters uh, elected to reset that levy to 50 cents. So the total revenue for the city, uh, specifically fire, um, is increasing from 9.4 million to 16.8. So that accounts for most of that, in, that nearly $10 million increase. And that 16.8 million will remain steady, and so the amount per thousand will decrease for people, which is why it was 0.358 in 2021, or excuse me, 2022, and will go up to yeah. 50 cents per thousand. So per this, this, for 23, yeah, that's, that's the reason it's not uh, eligible to be increased by 1%, but next year it would be. So we would assume the normal schedule with that. So here's that breakdown as far as taxpayer impact that we were discussing earlier. I have two tables here. The top table is what I would call the realistic version where property values have increased. The lower table is simply to demonstrate uh, the impact of that levy rate decreasing. So if someone's property value happens to not increase, their taxes would decrease because of that. Um, but moving back up to the top table, there's a lot there, but I, I want to look mostly at the three hundred and four hundred thousand dollar sections because, given current median home prices between four and four hundred and five hundred thousand, this is going to represent the most people. So, without except without including the one percent increase for property taxes, uh, someone in that range would have their bill increased by one hundred and fourteen dollars to one hundred and fifty three. If the 1% increase is implemented, that would be 123 and 164. Ultimately, the 1% increase uh, accounts for between eight and $11 for those people uh, as far as the impact to their annual bill. So just visually representing all of this, you'll see that we have a blue section for the general fund and, and then a green section for other funds. Other funds are included because we have our uh, regular property tax levy, and then we have our public, safe, public safety lid lift, which is a component of that levy, but we also distribute portions of the property taxes to the other funds, uh, specifically fire pension, streets, library, um, and then tax increment financing districts, Kendall Yards, uh, Iron Bridge, so on. Um, but ultimately, you can see there that we have a slight decrease in the general fund um, component of the 2023 proposed budget. That's primarily due to how we calculate the library's dis distribution. Um, it's tied to appraised values, which have increased by 30%, so quite a bit is going uh, to the library in this case. So now I want to look at sales tax. Uh, I'll just cover quickly cover the components of the 9% sales tax that we pay here and then break down our portion of that tax a little further uh, and then show what it means for us in terms of revenue. So 6.5% of the 9% goes to the state of Washington. Below that we have 1% for the city of Spokane. However, 15% of our 1% goes to the county. So really it's 0.85% for us. And then the transit authority has 0.8%. Public Facilities District 0.1. All of those, except for all of the following, uh, except for affordable housing, go to the county, and uh, they do distribute some of it to us, but ultimately it goes to them. 
So looking at the sales tax history compared to a 3% baseline, just for a, a good comparison over time, we have a date range of 2005 to 2023 over there in the right. And you can see in 2008, we have the financial crisis hit. So we have major recession and it takes until between 2017 and 2018 to fully recover uh, to that 3% baseline. Then nearly immediate, immediately we have the pandemic where demand lags below, so we have a reduction in our revenue. And what I would say, a full recovery from that in terms of spending, just because you see a trend going there and it lags and then starts again. Um, that leads to our 2023 budget. Uh, we're projecting that we hit $66.7 million. One thing I'll say about that is that right now we're experiencing massive inflation. So 2022 is, is going to be at least 8%. Uh, so ultimately, we are projecting a retraction in terms of practical uh, value that we have. Moving on to utility taxes, uh, there are two components to this, the city utilities and private utilities. Overall, we're projecting a 2.83% increase for city utilities. And for private utilities, we're projecting a 1.46% decrease in all go in a little bit into that, the reason for that. Just to give some framing to this, utility taxes for the city utilities include water, electric, sewer, stormwater, integrated capital, and solid waste, while private utilities include electric, natural gas, uh, telephone, and cable. So these are the city utilities. We have a pretty decent trend going. When the pandemic hit, we have that reduction there um, just due to delinquencies in payments. And then we've started to rise again. So the $47.1 million in the 2023 proposed budget is right on trend, essentially. For private utility taxes, we've over time seen slight decreases uh, last year, we had budgeted a little bit more than the previous year, but we were dropping that back down for 2023, primarily due to the trend in telephone and cable utility taxes. So everything to the left of the 2022 adopted budget is actual. And um, we had increased that budget in 22, but are choosing to decrease it again in 23 because it's still just following that same trend line people getting rid of their phone, landlines, uh, dropping cable, those things are, are essentially contributing here. And that concludes everything I had planned. I can <laughs> take any questions if you have any, or I can. Any questions for Jay? That was good. Super informative, Jay, mm -hmm. really. Thanks. Really appreciate that, thank you. All right, now we'll go to public testimony. And <coughs> uh, Gary Dennis, if you're still there, if you wanna hit star three. Gary, one more time, if you're there, if you want to hit star three. All right, not seeing Gary. I'm looking for a motion to continue this hearing until November 7th. Moved. So moved. Second. Okay, moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Any abstentions? All right, great. All right, we're gonna to go to first reading ordinances and uh, oftentimes uh, we just read them both and then take testimony on both. Um, this time I'm gonna do them separately. Uh, we're gonna take the uh, nuclear free zone first and, but go ahead and read both of them because one person signed up to testify on both, Mr. Alder. So we'll do the nuclear free, we'll end with Mr. Alder and then we'll move into the Redistricting plan. Okay. Ordinance C36298, adopting a city council redistricting plan. I, uh, Ordinance C36299, establishing the city of Spokane as a zone free of nuclear armaments, enacting a new chapter 18.09 of the Spokane Municipal Code. Further action is deferred on the first reading ordinances. All right, and if you haven't read it closely, the ordinance basically um, 
ask the City of Spokane to design an investment policy to uh, prevent investments in the nuclear weapons industry and then also uh, requires us not to purchase goods and services from producers of nuclear arms unless it's the only place we can get the goods and service and uh, declares Spokane a nuclear free zone. We passed a resolution to this effect a few years ago. Um, but we've got several people asking to testify. The first is, well, before that, let me give you my little talk on uh, public testimony, since some of you haven't been here for a while. So uh, you have three minutes. We've got a timer. It'll turn yellow when there's one minute. It'll turn red when your time's up, and I'll ask you to uh, stop at that point. I ask you to address your comments to me as the chair. I ask you not to call out individual people um, and just confine yourself to the issues. Uh, also, we don't have uh, clapping or booing uh, or any other disruptive testimony. We like to create a safe space so people can speak their mind regardless of how many people agree with them. And uh, we don't allow, I don't see any signs in the audience, but we don't allow sign waving. But you can wear your buttons. And with that, I'm going to call up, uh, I'm going to call up people in sets of three, but Bart, ha Bart Hagen's going to be the first. Bart, if you want to come up. After Bart is Tom Charles. And if you're far back, you can come. The second row has plenty of seats. And after Tom Charles is um, Tom Robinson. Good evening. Welcome. Shortly after I retired in 1999, we went to Japan and uh, stayed with a family in Hiroshima. The very first day, we went to the memorial. The large grass area, the size of a football field, held the Peace Museum at one end of it. The sculpture in polished steel is in the middle with impressionistic, uh, polished, uh, impressionistic hands holding the flame that will burn until the last nuclear weapon is destroyed. At the far end of the field <clears throat> is a river the size of our Spokane River. And just across the river stands the ruins of the former city hall. I'm sure you've all seen the picture. We crossed over that former Dome, we crossed over to that former dome building, which was beneath the explosion. We stood there at ground zero and felt the power of the bomb that was set off about 500 feet up. The other five rivers in the city were sucked up into the stratosphere only to descend as the radioactive black rain that caused so much destruction, short-term and long-term, and loss of life. It was more than a profound experience to stand there and imagine the experience of that terrible day in 1945. My wife and I had made it a high priority to go to our river and stand with friends to remember the first time an atomic weapon was used on a civilian population. It happened once more in Nagasaki. Standing there at Ground Zero made us anti-nuclear weapons activists from that point on. Now we find ourselves as close as we have been since the two bombs were dropped to a nuclear reaction to war events. Let us dedicate this city to help discourage any more mushroom clouds. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. Uh, Tom Charles, and after Tom is Tom Robinson, and then Justin O'Connell. Uh, my name is Tom Charles. I'm a member of Veterans for Peace in Pax Christi here in Spokane. We are asking for your support of this ordinance. 
we believe it makes a statement not only to our city and our state, but even to the world, that all nations need to work together to ban nuclear weapons. With a fraction of the trillions of dollars we have spent on nuclear weapons alone, we could have made huge inroads into reducing homelessness. We could have eliminated hunger in a country where one in every seven of our children go to bed hungry every night. We could have provided universal free health care in a country where 34 million of our fellow citizens have no health insurance and two-thirds of all bankruptcies are because of an inability to pay for medical care. And we could have repaired much of our bridges, highways, gas, and water lines. Instead, America and the other nuclear nations of the world have chosen to build weapon systems that have placed the entire world one step away from nuclear destruction. The nuclear weapons industry asks only that you be silent on this issue because it knows our Congress will then continue to send them your dollars. A person cannot be neutral on this issue. If you do not oppose nuclear weapons, then by your lack of action, you become their supporter and join forces with this terrible industry. To go through life under the continuous threat of nuclear war is a dreadful way to live, especially for our children. We deserve better. Our children and our world deserve better. The nuclear nations of the world need to change, and our country can lead that change. An ordinance such as this can be a significant first step, step not just for our city, but for all the cities of the earth that hope to make this world a better place. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Tom. Uh, Tom Robinson, then Justin O'Connell, and then uh, George Taylor. Hi, I'm a resident of Spokane, uh, and I was born and raised here. And uh, at about age six, I was attending Grant School, and uh, this would be in about 1953. The Soviets had just developed uh, uh, their first nuclear weapons that they could uh, deliver over to this country. And so we had our, our, us kids at school had our first air raid drill, and they told us about crawling underneath our desks. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty uh, interesting, so I went home, told my mom about what we had done. And my mom was extremely well-read and up on events, and she was also really frank with me and never, never pulled any punches. And she said, you don't need to worry about that. Uh, she made it real clear that no one in Spokane would be alive because Fairchild Air Force Base would be a major target for nuclear weapons. And uh, Spokane would not exist. Uh, the only punch she pulled was she didn't say the world will not exist. And that's where we are. Now, we're going to spend a trillion dollars in the coming years on new nuclear weapons. And the question is, why do we need to spend another trillion dollars? Uh, just pour that money down the drain. And on top of that, uh, getting the uranium ore necessary to uh, build those nuclear weapons. Uh, it's another thing that happened uh, around Spokane. The Spokane Indians on their reservation, uh, suddenly each one of them started receiving money because they were mining uh, uranium ore on that reservation. Then we find out later that so many of them have died from radiation poisoning because of how uh, uh, crude and, and awful the situation was on the reservation. Uh, I'm real happy about your decision. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Justin O'Connell, then George Taylor, and then Nick Brown. Good evening, Council. I hope you're doing very well tonight. 
Declaring the city a nuclear-free zone? Are you mad? People are back practically marching in the streets for war. Long gone are the days of Iraq when we had record-breaking anti-war protests. We practically had them in the streets for war at this point. So I guess we should uh, bring the drum circle from outside of council chambers into council chambers. A little nuclear saber rattling and you all get cold feet. I guess that's why I have the job at central planning. Just kidding, I know you've been working on this for quite a while, since Woodstock. I can neither confirm nor deny if there are nuclear bombs in the area. It has been reported that the nuclear bombs were taken from the area, from the Air, uh, the Air Force Base uh, in 91 or 97, it kind of depends on who you ask, I guess. These nuclear bombs might have been actually the ones used in the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. I believe the spokesman review reported that, it had that escalated. That was back when we used diplomacy. You know, the main difference between the Cuban Missile Crisis and now, it happened before uh, Kennedy had actually lost his mind. So all I know is we have this little strategy known as full spectrum dominance. It means we have all the weapons. This ordinance says that the city shall not invest in nuclear arms. What about the neutron bomb industry? That's my fave. Kills all organic matter, leaves the buildings. Your ordinance also says that whereas nuclear war threatens to destroy most higher life forms on this planet, that's speciesist, I believe. Um, we're not better than single-celled organisms. What about the cockroach? We actually partnered with the cockroach on the nuclear bomb. We need to rewrite this to be a little more inclusive of lower life forms. There's also another line, the US, quote, the US has a sufficient stockpile of nuclear weapons to defend itself and destroy the world several times over. That's actually debatable. Some say that a nuclear war would only kill about 100 million people. That's mal numbers. Last century, the boys and I at Central Planning, we ran a little split test, uh, World War I and World War II. The former was known for biological and chemical weapons, the latter for uh, nukes. So uh, we've uh, developed a little bit of an investment strategy based on that split test uh, that can inform your future investing. So you're not investing in nuclear arms. That means no Boeing, no Lockheed Martin, no Northrop Grunman. Here's the uh, uh, alternative investment strategy, Pfizer and Moderna. Now, I'd like to close with a moment of silence for the fathers of the nuclear bombs, Edward Teller, J. Robert Oppenheimer, and the cockroaches. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. And uh, George Taylor, Nick Braun, and then Teresa McCann. Good evening, council members and council president Beggs. My name is George Taylor. I'm a homeowner on South Hill for the past 10 years. Tonight, I'm speaking to you as Vice President of the Spokane Veterans for Peace chapter that has been an active peace organization in this city since 1985. Our purpose is to expose the true cause of war and to prevent future wars. During my active years in the United States Navy, my ship was involved in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I, I want to speak to the last speaker. That was exactly the same situation that we're in today. We support unanimously as a chapter this nuclear free zone ordinance before you tonight as a first hearing. And we urge you to support this good law that will benefit all the citizens of our city. 35 years ago, I was in another city hall to witness that city council and mayor unanimously pass a similar ordinance called the Nuclear Park Maryland nuclear free ordinance prohibiting the city of Tacoma Park from doing business in purchasing any product from stationary to police cars with any company or corporation that makes any components for the nuclear weapons industry in this country. That Tacoma Park City Ordinance has stood the test of time and survived challenges in court. And I understand this ordinance before you tonight and two weeks tonight from tonight when you vote for it has passed muster with our city attorney. At that same city council meeting, <clears throat> I recall one citizen objecting to the proposed ordinance saying that this was a federal matter and the city should stick to collecting garbage and fixing potholes in the streets. The mayor of the city, who in that form of city government, met as a voting member of the city council, stood to his full height in the mayor's chair and said to that citizen, what about the one big pothole that this city would be 
in the event of a nuclear war. This is a matter of concern, he said, in a nuclear age that affects the welfare of every citizen in this city, regardless of political affiliation. That ordinance was passed by unanimous vote and still exists today in Tacoma Park, Maryland. At the entrance of their city, they have a sign saying, Welcome to Tacoma Park, a nuclear-free city. Since then, many cities in the USA have adopted similar nuclear-free ordinances. In the state of Washington, we have the cities of Walla Walla, Olympia, and others who have passed similar laws and resolutions George? regarding nuclear-free zone. George, we're at the end of your time. Thank you. Thanks for coming down. Uh, Nick, Braun, and after Nick, Teresa McCann, and then Ray Thorne. Hello, I'm Nick Braun. I'm representing the uh, Dorothy Day Labor Forum, an organization of community people, labor people, and students um, who are for peace and justice. But really what I wanted to say today is um, that this is a nonpartisan issue. Um, I want to remind people that um, General Eisenhower, who was the first um, Supreme Commander of NATO, thought that the United States should be out of NATO by 1960. General Eisenhower also created the Adams for Peace policy. Wanted to contact the Soviets and work with Adams for Peace for, for uh, atomic medicine, nuclear medicine, etc. cetera. Um, and at the end of the Eisenhower administration, he said, beware the unwarranted assumption of power by the military industrial complex. And he was responding, he was actually aiming to a certain degree at Kennedy. John Kennedy during the 50s was noted for constantly talking about the missile gap. Um, and um, he was also, as, um, as was just mentioned, um, led into a confrontation and almost blew up the world uh, over um, um, the Cuba situation. So I think it's a nonpartisan issue um, and I think that um, people can come together for, um, for Adams for Peace, um, for a policy of, um, uh, of sanity. The philosopher and psychoanalyst Eric Fromm said there are two kinds of mental illness today. He was speaking in 1960 when Eisenhower made his speech. He said, one kind of illness is, is rep represented by people who are constantly seeing evil and dangerous things that are not evil and dangerous. The other kind of illness is when something is evil and dangerous, they refuse to see it. So um, I think this nuclear ordinance will be great. And thank you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Teresa McCann, and after Teresa, Ray Thorne, and then Hollis Higgins. Good evening. I wanted to share um, a personal experience first. Uh, when I was about 20 years old, I remember seeing a film on television um, about the bombing at Hiroshima, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I don't know why I was 20 years old and hadn't realized what had happened there and the effect on the human beings who were there, uh, whose lives were lost and also whose lives were damaged for many years to come. Um, it was a very graphic documentary um, and I was, I remember crying and I also remembered saying um, that I wanted to commit myself to doing what I could to rid the world of nuclear weapons so that this could never happen again. Um, all my efforts have been small, and I think that, again, this is a small effort, but um, also very important for our city. Small efforts turn into large movements. Um, I think there's already been 220 other cities, U.S. cities, who have declared themselves as nuclear-free zones. Um, it would be great to add Spokane to this. I've lived in Spokane all my life. Um, and I would be very proud if we could do this in Spokane. Um, I also wanted to address 
again, the trillions of dollars that have been spent on nuclear weapons. And there's so many issues, as Tom Charles mentioned, that could be addressed uh, with this money that affect us that we see every day in Spokane. Homelessness, addiction, mental illness. Um, we heard about an issue tonight about um, education, about pregnancy and birth and supporting uh, education in that area. Also, our north-south freeway infrastructure. I've lived here all my life, and I can't wait till the north-south freeway might ever be finished. Um, another area I just wanted to address briefly is just looking at the beautiful art here um, and to think about our world being destroyed from these weapons um, is just unbearable. And I'd just like, like to end, if, if I can squeeze this in, a little quote from uh, Pope Francis um, that he says, the use of atomic energy for purposes of war is immoral just as the possessing of nuclear weapons is immoral. And I think we all need to hopefully work in little ways that we can to rid the world of, of, um, of the nuclear weapons. And even though this effort might be some symbolic in Spokane, it does have some actionable efforts as well. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, Ray Thorne is Ray here. I don't see Ray. Um, Hollis Higgins, and then Michael Pollan. And then uh, Twyla Abrahamson. Good evening, council members. Thank you very much for uh, having us here today to speak to this issue. Uh, I wanna thank all the council members for, for representing us and working so hard to make our city better. Uh, Today we face a catastrophic uh, situation. Some say that it's 99 seconds to midnight. Others say it's one second to midnight. We have a crisis. Uh, Fairchild's only 10 minutes away from here. It's a big giant gas bomb. It's a target. I did the overlay. A bomb the size that was used at Hiroshima would annihilate Spokane. Just annihilate and that doesn't even count the shock waves. Uh, today we can join like-minded human beings around the world. Uh, there are nuclear weapons free zones around the world. Japan has thousands of precincts that have declared themselves nuclear free. Uh, one third of New Zealand apparently is about, um, uh, about that same thing. Um, there are 211 existing mayors for peace. A nice goal to think about for Spokane. Uh, 122 countries have voted to uh, implement the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. 13 more have indicated that they will also uh, vote for that. That would be 135 countries. Uh, 19 members of Congress are now nuclear abolitionists. Uh, and so far, of the 135 countries, 91 have now signed the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and 68 have ratified it. More all the time. Everyone is starting to realize worldwide what a crisis this is. Uh, so, making Spokane a zone free of nuclear weapons, this is a carefully crafted ordinance, three years in the making. It was not easy to do. Uh, a lot of research went into it, um, but I'll tell you what, it's so finely crafted that it has been sent around the world as a template for other countries, other towns and counties to use, uh, to duplicate. Um, so this is actually a genius type uh, event. Also right now, the Golden Rule Peace Ship from Veterans for Peace which I'm the secretary of the local chapter, is now coming down the Mississippi River, gonna go around Florida, up into New York, and then back to the Great Lakes with 300 stops talking about the dangers of nuclear weapons. So I wanted to thank you for your consideration in passing this ordinance. Thank you, Hollis. Uh, Michael Poulin, after Michael, Twyla Abrahamson, and then John Alder.
Wouldn't it be grand if our descendants could point to us tonight and say, this is where the avalanche began and rid our world of nuclear arms? If not us, who? If not when, now. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Twyla, are you here? Uh, oh, it's by phone. Twyla, if you're still there, if you want to hit star three. All right. Twyla, welcome to Spokane City Council. Hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Twyla Abrahamson Swan. I'm a member of the Spokane tribe. And in the 90s, um, my mother started an organization called Shawl Society. It stands for Sovereignty, Health, Air, Water, and Land. And this grassroots organization was formed um, because to respond to the, the impact from two uranium mine sites and a uranium mill site adjacent to the Spokane Reservation. Our family lives on Shimakin Creek, which flows into the Spokane River and eventually into the Columbia River. And upstream from our family home is decades of radioactive uranium and radioactive waste. Um, it's currently leaking into the groundwater near the reservation. Um, one of the mine sites on the reservation um, was declared a Superfund site. And cleanup plans for that site include water treatment forever. So today I'm calling in in support of the ordinance as a, a member of a community directly impacted by the nuclear fuel cycle. Um, we consider ourselves victims of war as well because of the resources and the mess that was left on our land, the toxic legacy of the development of nuclear weapons, which still hasn't been cleaned up to this day. And so we feel that any, any activity to prevent more investment, more involvement whatsoever in the nuclear industry is against what we feel we need to move on to a clean and sustainable environment and thank everybody that is there tonight in testifying. I think, you know, the, the reservation is not far from Spokane. Um, part of that waste cycle is still being transported through Spokane. So, and the, the jurisdictions don't have the capacity to clean up if there were ever an accident on this route. Um, with that water treatment in perpetuity, comes an additional waste stream. Right now, the mining company involved is sending that waste to the Four Corners area, the Ute Mountain Reservation. And so we need to keep all of the communities across the country, all of those communities that have been impacted by the nuclear cycle because the resources haven't been there to clean up the, those messes and the resources haven't been put in place to address the health impacts that have also been left right. behind. Twyla, so thank you very much. Thank you so much for participating. Uh, all right, so last person on this issue, but first person on redistricting is John Alder, if you're here, John. You have three minutes total to address both. Address both of them? Yep. Okay, we'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, first redistricting, having gone through a recent state redistricting plan, I was not too happy about being switched from the third district to the sixth. I developed a very good trusting relationship with the reps and senator there. Fat chance of that in the sixth district. I'm not sure what your plans detail, but I'm not sure. But I'm going to say instead of changing maps, how about have, have an agenda that promotes secure, secure housing, medicine, and food supply? Maybe if both Republicans and Democrats would follow this, they would have to stop worrying about where people live in the, on the city. Okay, as far as nuclear, anti-nuclear ordinance, other than the fact nuclear bombs are expensive, dangerous, 
and, many, and, and money would go to better use on solar energy. I want to show people just how this may think this, local, this is a local issue, not just a state which has the largest arsenal of any state in the U.S. We can start with Hanford, which built the first bomb, and eventually it became a very mile west site that leaks uh, radioactive waste into Columbia, which feeds water into the Snake and, and the Spokane rivers. All these rivers probably need to be tested now for uh, nuclear activity. Next, we have the bomb falling the Japanese, which led many residents to Spokane, which leads to the famous institute we have there now by the, uh, by the Spokane Falls. Many of them suffer from a cancer suffered by the blast, as have the Marshall Islanders, who has so many atomic blasts that, uh, that one of their islands will remain uninhabitable for 23,000 years. Guess what? Many of them here are now in Spokane to receive medical care from the effects of the blasts, which is thanks, and thanks to the Washington State Legislature that passed for, for that kind of care. Last but not least, is what, uh, what previously was mentioned, was our native indigenous friends on the Spokane Reservation, who also suffer from a cancer due to the uranium uh, dining, mining at Midnight Mine. Two of Spokane's favorites, Deb Abramson and Darlene McCarty, died from this cancer attributed to the exposure of this. So you see, this, we would be better off spending our time and energy on solar, wind, and reusable energy, rather than uh, nuclear energy. Tonight's night, we could start, we could vote yes on this, and get, get a clean start again. Thank you. Thank you, John. I didn't even get the red, I like that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're, most of you are here to talk about redistricting, and uh, before we get to everybody else, I'm gonna let our three uh, voting uh, redistricting commissioners give us their perspective, three minutes each, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it by council number. So Jennifer Thomas from District 1, Heather Beebe Stevens from District 2, and then Rick Friedlander from District 3 and our chair. And I'll just give you three minutes to Who's share. Who's gonna All right, I'm wrong. I'm corrected. <laughs> Rick's going to give an overall presentation, and then I'll hear from uh, Jennifer and Heather. So Rick, come on up. And you have unlimited time to give the presentation, so thank you. Well, I've, I've got, uh, good evening, everybody. I have four minutes and 56 seconds. You're so, good. You're good. Um, that ought to work. I didn't get the memo. <laughs> so, yeah, good. It's, it's okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come and, uh, and represent our committee uh, to present the proposed redistricting map that we as a committee worked out. Our group consisted of three voting members. Can we have, yeah, they're there. Um, Jennifer Thomas representing District 1, Heather B.B. Stevens, District 2, and myself, Rick Friedlander. We were appointed by the mayor, and we had two advisors, Mr. Beggs, and representing the entire council was Mr. Zappone, I believe. Uh, I don't know how you got selected to the, the task, but uh, there you were. Uh, incredible staff, Ms. Allers and Mr. Piccolo. Thank you for your guidance and keeping us in the guardrails. Uh, I learned something during the course of, of looking at the tapes, the uh, preparation for this meeting, that there's something that I, uh, I found that I, I'm very worried about myself going forward, and that's that in the video, my bald spot shows up that I didn't know I had. <laughs> so <it's, laughs> anyway, so forg forgiveness to, to all of you back there. Um, our task was to redraw the district boundaries uh, to account for the population growth shifts consistent with the following criteria. Um, here we go. That each internal director would have nearly equal uh, population as possible. Each district be as compact as possible. Each district be geographically contiguous area. Population data was, could not be used uh, to favor or disfavor any uh, racial group or political party. And the district boundaries would coincide where possible with existing recognized natural boundaries. Okay, um, let's go on to slide four, I think. One more down. Here we go. With that, we all came together and stated what we'd like to see happen. And uh, I'm sorry, not quite ready for this. Uh, given the scope of our charge, that is to effect minor changes and doing our best to even up the population of the three districts. I left our first meeting thinking this will be a piece of cake. 
move a precinct or two from District 1 to District 2, I'm sorry, the other way around, uh, from District 2 to District 1, and that's it. Unfortunately, I mean fortunately, we conducted a thought exchange from which two ideas came forward. Wouldn't it be nice for the redrawn districts to consolidate the neighborhoods within a distinct district? And this was a thought further borne out by our meetings with neighborhood councils. And wouldn't it be nice for each district to have a piece of downtown? Then, given that, we came up with the, our, our, kind of, our kind of mission within the, within the guidelines is, okay, you have to make population as equal as possible. The, the number was, I think, 76,329 was the dead average, <laughs> plus or minus 1,900 and eight. Um, be fair. Uh, not, not try and goof, goof around with anything, as was, as was uh, outlined in the statute. Try to keep neighborhoods within single districts, okay, and consider giving each district a presence in downtown. When we learned that the county auditor's office would be happy to adjust precinct lines to accommodate our shifts, a flurry of creativity was unleashed. We came up with, I think, about 16, 17 different map possibilities. I got stuck with only one because I couldn't get the thing to, couldn't get the software to publish more maps. It got stuck on the one that I had. Um, so we had some wild ones. Uh, we united neighborhoods within a district, including a long skinny one that had the West Hills and Leita and uh, what's the other neighborhood down there in District 3. So kind of a full Western shot. Uh, there was another one that cut through the middle from uh, the Northeast all the way down to uh, Airway Heights. Um, unfortunately, uh, and, and Jennifer, uh, Ms. Thomas, and Mr. Zappone produced, each produced one that were quite similar to each other, that were the only ones enabled to, to reunite the Riverside neighborhood. So we tried. Uh, so neighborhoods, listen. <laughs> unfortunately, keeping those Riverside and West Hills neighborhoods intact led to some weird shapes. I will, I will, suggest, I will let you know that all of our actions were decided unanimously. And all three voting members decided to go forward with the four that were representative of various ideas to collect some more public input and go forward with a recommendation, hopefully by October 4th. And let's go ahead and look down uh, at the uh, survey data, which showed very hard to see, but basically uh, the simplest one uh, was, was the favorite. And let's just skip on down to the map itself. Here we go. Uh, two of the maps kept the West Hills intact, which led to an odd blob of, of, of District 2 extending to the north and failing the compact criteria. Map 3 did a very nice job of meeting the population shift while following a natural boundary by drawing the line between District 1 and 2 following the Ben Burr Trail. This also consolidated much, much of the East Central neighborhood into District 1. Following that round of, uh, second round of output and survey monkey and comments at the public hearing on October 4th though, it became clear that our original thought of moving a precinct or two would be the simplest and, and most uh, uh, expeditious way to go. And therefore, unanimously, we voted to submit for the council's approval a map in which precinct number 3202, I believe, uh, thank you, Jennifer, and uh, which is bounded by Division, uh, 4th Street or the freeway, Monroe Street and the river be moved from District 2 to District, I'm sorry, from District 2 to District 1, thereby meeting the criteria of shifting the population with the minimal amount of, of a change and so forth. Perhaps during the next round of redistricting, which will be in five years? Potentially, there's a voluntary. We could do it in five years or wait for the 10. Thank you. Populations will shift further or back and considerations of neighborhoods might be put further ahead, as was indicated in our initial round of, of uh, information. I am disappointed in statements made and published suggesting 
actually questioning the ethicality, excuse me, of any member or advisor's motivations or contributions to this process. In the meantime, thank you very much for your time and our opportunity to serve the community. Thanks also to my fellow members, our advisors, and the public for their participation. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Rick, before you go, two things. One, I just wanted to clarify, there's going to be some uh, uh, map redrawing nerds that heard you say that the map uh, number two was shared by uh, council, uh, commission members Thomas and Zapone, but I think it was count Commissioner B.B. Stevens and Zapone who no. had the same one, I thought. Well, we, 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 all, had, we all had, there, there were several that, that had, I think, I think you're incorrect there, but I might well, be. You, I could be. I just didn't know if you missed. It doesn't, you doesn't really matter. The point is we it all doesn't. three unanimously yep. put those four yep. maps forward for the public yep. consideration. Yep. Based on, again, the plethora of creativity that came forward. Yep. It doesn't really matter who came up with them. We voted. We said we'd like these yep. four to go out. I appreciate it. I thought you might have just missed, but so you, you remember it. You were the chair. That's great. I just wanted to take this moment. And we'll let the other two commissioners speak for three minutes each, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you, all three of you, for your hard work and many hours and creativity, and we all owe you a debt of gratitude for your service. You probably didn't know what you were signing up for when you uh, put your name in, but uh, thank you so much for all of you. Really Again, appreciate that. Again, thanks for the opportunity yep. to serve. Yep. All right. Thanks. Thank um, Jennifer Thomas, if you would, I'm just going to give you and Commissioner B.B. Stevens the opportunity to go first on this and share your three minutes of thoughts for us. Thank you. I, um, I echo um, what Rick said. Um, so Zach and I, on August 31st, we both did have maps that um, I was able to merge all the neighborhoods oh, for okay. wow. um, uh, that are currently split, and um, Zach did as well. Um, Heather had one that was similar to Zach's, but we as a group chose to not forward um, those simply because they, um, uh, Heather's are mine, because they didn't balance population um, as well. So um, I also agree with what Rick said that it would be nice to satisfy everyone. We, I think each one of us um, would have there are parts of this um, process that we have not enjoyed. It's been um, grueling and difficult. And um, I would like to, uh, I, I would love to see everyone leave happy, but um, you yourself, Council President Beggs, um, at the very beginning of this process, you told us that it would be difficult and people would be, um, show up from all sorts of places with opinions about the process that we were undertaking. And, um, and you shared with us that perhaps, I think it was you, it might have been someone else, but that um, perhaps the best map would be one where we all had to find some compromise. And um, I shared on October 4th when we had the town hall that there's a difference between responsibility and authority. And we, I think, the together, we would, we would feel the responsibility to want to merge neighborhood councils because that would be a nice thing. I think that some of the feedback, not all of the feedback, was that um, neighborhoods would enjoy that. Um, the flip side is that that wasn't important to everybody and the RCW said that our most important task was population. So though um, we might feel a responsibility to fix the issues that neighborhoods are facing, it's not where our authority lies, the redistricting board, nor is it city council's job at this point to try to fix uh, neighborhood councils that would be community assembly or the neighborhoods themselves. So um, we did agree together as a group to forward maps for public feedback. We also agreed together to forward them to you council to adopt the map with minimal changes and the best balanced population. Any other map other than the one we forwarded um, should only greater adhere to the RCW. So thank you so much for your time tonight. Again, thank you. Heather, BB Stevens. 
Hello. I just wanted to take a minute to thank everyone who participated in the online survey. I was lucky enough to represent the three of us at uh, the August, I believe it was, meeting of all the neighborhood councils and to thank them for letting me speak. And then to thank them all for inviting us to come and talk with them a little bit more individually. I was able to go to one meeting in District 2, which is where I'm from. Um, and then I also represented Jennifer in uh, District 1 as well. And so I just want to say thank you to that. This has not been an easy process. Uh, by any means, um, but I think it is the best map that we could come up with in the parameters that we were given. And I want to thank Rick for his work getting us through this process and also thank um, Council President Beggs and Council Member Zappone for taking the extra time to work with us there. All right, thank you. All right, um, let's, we'll go ahead and do some testimony. We'll probably take a break at uh, 8.15 just because we've been at it for a while, but the first three people to uh, come forward is gonna be Ed Stevenson, Mary Winkus, and Aaron Rivkin. Council President, just a point oh, of personal privilege. Sorry, yes, quick. go ahead. I want to thank uh, Heather, Rick, and um, Jennifer Thomas as well because I know it's it was a lot of time, a lot of effort that you all put into it, and uh, you know you probably had a lot more boos than yays, but uh, what you did I thought was really good, and I appreciate your service to your city. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> all right, Mr. Stevenson, welcome. Hi, I'm Ed minutes. Stevenson, Spokane. And, um, you know, we need elected officials who are listening to the people who elected them and not officials who are willing to manipulate votes. And why I'm saying that is, as mentioned on the October 4th, pu the public outcry was pretty significant and in favor of map one. But now that map has been redistricted or redrawn, it appears. But thankfully for the redistricting board, they initially said that they were going to support map one and submit it unanimously for recommendation to the city council. Now the majority of the council appears to want to discredit the public input and are planning to push through a new gerrymandered map that was drawn uh, by a council member. And it seems this redrawing of the boundaries of district by council members of Pone uh, who just won count, uh, District 3 by only 273 Mr. votes. Oh, Mr. Stevenson, so we, again, have a rule to address me and not call out mm -hmm. individual people. Please talk about your ideas and your concepts. Sure. This is great. Uh, this individual won District 3 by 273 votes. Additionally, the count, council member served on the advisory member uh, board as a non-voting member. Uh, he also knows where all the votes came from, so it would be in his best interest to draw the lines to be get reelected. And I think that it would be in his best interest or our best interest to recruit, recuse himself as another board member did tonight on another matter. Uh, we want to make sure that we are not manipulating voters, but we are supporting voters and doing what is in their best interest, not in what is in the council's best interest. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Mr. Stevenson. Uh, Mary Winkus, after Mary is Aaron Rivkin, and then Earl Moore. Good evening. Uh, thank you uh, for having uh, me give it, have a chance to speak. Um, I want to start by saying that the districting process has become politicized, mm -hmm. which was one of the things that was not supposed to happen. Uh, map two is the only map that meets the criteria set, set out that says that we keep neighborhood councils together. And I've been a chair of a neighborhood council for far too long and been on the city, uh, uh, the CA for a number of years as well. And I know when city, uh, that neighborhood councils work best when they are uh, within a single district and can uh, rely on their uh, representatives here on the city council. Um, the map one still splits neighborhood councils, and I think that's a major problem. Uh, and uh, I think that should have been addressed, and map two does not. Uh, keeping the neighborhood councils together without splitting them makes it easier for uh, the neighborhood councils to work together collaboratively and within a single district and have representatives that are one and the same for that district. Uh, two board members, or, and I, I heard tonight almost three, three board members drew a map that was 
almost the same that would have done that, and yet somehow or another that did not go through. Um, in, in the Inlander article, it says that uh, one of the uh, board members said that MAP2 uh, met multivariant uh, criteria and was praised for being creative. So I'm not sure how we shifted to from one, two to one. I think it's a creative solution too. What followed after the four maps were um, unveiled was unfortunate. There were three meetings, but I will tell you, I'm a neighborhood council chair and I didn't hear about them. Um, they said there was one with the neighborhood councils. Really? I wasn't there. I never heard about it. Uh, and the first one I heard only had one, first meeting had only one person there. So somehow the communication on all this was somewhat flawed. Um, and the survey I heard from a lot of people was very difficult to fill out and a lot of people quit midway and didn't submit the survey. So the results of the survey were less than scientific. Um, and, and this is something that's gonna have to last for 10, maybe five, but a long time. And I would like to see that the neighborhood councils have a shot, we have enough issues we have to deal with, of working well together and being uh, collaborative and cohesive within a single district. Um, this is all can be settled because the next step from board uh, is to go to, si to city council to exercise their authority and rein this process that's become so politicized in. We've had dueling surveys, we've had dueling tonight, dueling testimony, but somebody's gonna have to make a decision and it needs to be one, I mean, you need to understand Mary. it's a consequential one. Okay, so uh, may, may I end by saying, please don't split any dis uh, neighborhood right. council and pass two. Thanks, Mary. Um, next is gonna be Aaron Rivkin, and then Earl Moore, and then Betty. It starts with an L, I'm not gonna quite be able to read your right, but Lordis or something like that, so. And feel free, people, to make your way up like Earl did here to, the, to be ready. Aaron. Welcome. Hey, thanks, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Aaron Rifkin. I'm a business owner here in Spokane. Uh, and many of my businesses lie in different districts. And so uh, I just want to say thanks to the committee that had put forth this map. And I do support um, what this committee is doing. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Aaron. Earl. And then after Earl, Betty, and then William Hagee. Again, uh, thank you, President Bates. And the Spokane City Council, again, I always thank you for your time and your efforts. It is uh, commendable what you're doing. But tonight I want to speak to you about redistricting. We are at the tail end of a very long process. As you know, after months and months and lots of work, discussion, and public feedback, the Redistricting Commission unanimously voted to recommend a map that balances the populations of our three council districts and does so, as advised by state law with minimal changes. I was really dismayed to see articles in the papers that highlighted an effort to gerrymander the districts to the benefit of some sitting council members. I'm thankful the commission resisted this undue influence, saw through that effort to gerrymander and voted unanimously for map one. Well, so here I am again. <laughs> I'm hearing that the city council doesn't like what the commission recommended. So now you're talking about ignoring public input and gerrymandering the process to get, again, what you want, regardless of what the public wants. You guys, Council, this is Spokane, Washington. This is my city. I love this city. And you are considering doing something that should not be done in Spokane, Washington. Spokane wants fair elections that follow the process outlined by state law. I strongly encourage you to do the right thing and support Map 1 as unanimously recommended by the redistricting commission and that it was also made clear on numerous occasions this is what the majority of the people in this chamber have asked you for. If I was a member of the board and the city council overruled all of this work that 
they have worked so hard on, I would be very upset. And I would wonder why the board was formed if you as a city council are going to ignore the work because it didn't come up with the final product that you were not happy with. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Earl. Um, and again, another call out, I might not be getting the name, but if there's a Betty who's wanting to testify that starts with the last name L, come on forward. I'm not seeing anyone raise their hand. Online? What? Are they online? No. Uh, William, then Hagee, and after William is Sarah Cottom, and then Lorna Walsh. Perfect. Uh, good evening, President Beggs and City Council members. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm here on behalf of West Hills Neighborhood Council, uh, District 2 and 3. Uh, the map that was unanimously voted in, which was map 1, um, uh, I am personally and a number of uh, individuals, members, and on the Neighborhood Council in disagreement with due to the fact that it's still separates West Hills Neighborhood Council boundaries uh, into District 3. No offense for District 3. Uh, however, it is streamlining the communications with City Council uh, for a Neighborhood Council uh, boundaries to get support needed, advice, so on and so forth. Uh, back in 2016, we allocated $21,000 to a revitalization neighborhood planning uh, that was performed in Willstock's Way in uh, Spokane Falls Community College. Um, that's the level of support that West Hills has shown in their own neighborhood boundaries regardless of the districting, uh, you know, disconnect. Um, it's to my uh, understanding and also experience just in the survey itself uh, has largely been uh, not really well thought through and supported. In fact, I could have my grandchildren get on the internet over the weekend and take it as many times as they like, which is to me is not really uh, all due fairness. Um, and again, the RCW that's been discussed, um, you know, as you, as you look natural boundaries uh, in River Run through uh, Spokane Falls to Down River, that's that's our disconnect, which. In, has previously been impeded upon. So um, that was a little odd to begin with before the maps came out. And so I do ask that you, uh, you know, take a look at possible uh, wiggle room and altercations to one and, and give, uh, you know, some thought into uh, the natural boundaries. And thank you very much. Thank you, William. Sarah Cotton, and then Lorna Walsh, and then Anton. Hey, hello, uh, my name is Sarah Cottom and I am here to represent Associated Builders and Contractors of the Inland Pacific Chapter. Our association is located in the city of Spokane and we have 73 member companies that are in the city limits. And so they asked me to come here today on their behalf. And we also, in addition to the 73 in the city, we represent 251 members that do business in the city. So it was our understanding that the state law requires there be minimal changes to the district lines. So when I sent this information out to our members, they were pleased that there was a redistricting board and they were going to look at it and that their recommendation was map one. So them made sense. Everyone was in agreement with that. And then they learned through other outlets, social media and so forth, that it was possibly going in a different direction. So for them, that was concerning. So they asked me to come on their behalf. So what matters to myself and to our members is that we keep these districts balanced in population and using the least amount of changes. We don't wanna add potential barriers to ever do work here in Spokane. And then why put together a board if we're not going to take their recommendation? They didn't understand that and they asked me to come and speak on that. So I'm asking that you, or we are asking that you adopt the recommendation of the redistricting board uh, without any amendments and take into consideration all the hard work that they put into it. So, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Lorna Walsh, and then Antone, and then um, Tom Hormel. And you can go ahead and make your way down if you're My right. name is Lorna Walsh, I am a Spokane resident. And as a downtown resident and a member of the Riverside neighborhood, I urge you to support Map 2, 
which keeps the neighborhoods intact. East Central, West Hills, and Riverside neighborhoods are divided under proposed map one. This weakens the representation for the neighborhoods by dividing them into representation by three city council districts, as in the case of the Riverside neighborhood where I live, or dividing them along lines that split them as they have East Central along division. During the process, there was inadequate outreach and communication to the neighborhoods, uh, and Riverside, East Central, and West Hills neighborhoods were not represented by anyone on the three-member panel. Further, even the limited public outreach that was done with the thought exchange overwhelmingly responded with the desire to keep the neighborhoods together. Keeping neighborhood districts together is not gerrymandering. Weird shapes are not necessarily gerrymandering if they're keeping the neighborhoods together. Redistricting should not just be about having roughly the same number of people in each district, which it certainly should, but rather ensuring fair representation for people living in the districts and allowing for resident voices to be heard before major decisions affecting neighborhood resources like the East Central Library are made. In closing, I urge you to consider that people live downtown. It's not just about businesses. And to rethink the chosen map by approving map two, which keeps the neighborhoods intact. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Lorna. Antone, come on up. And after Antone, it's uh, Tom Hormel and then <coughs> Carrie McCombs. Uh, my name is Anton. Okay, I'm in favor of the redistricting, you know, and that's what you guys are elected to do. And I know that we can't please everybody, but you know, I, I appreciate what the three that did the survey, you know, and I'm in favor of it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And one thing I forgot to say, um, but people, council members, have reminded me. Please let us know what city you live in. Um, Tom Hormel, Carrie McCombs, and Leah Beth Zeisler. My name is Tom Hormel. I live in the city of Spokane Valley, but I've grown up in Spokane. I went to Lewis and Clark High School and graduated from there, and I work and play in this city. First, I want to thank the redistricting board today as I stand before you saddened, saddened that this council voted in by the very people they may disenfranchise by not accepting the redistricting board's recommendations. You asked for public comment on redistricting maps, and the public spoke and answered the survey and which supported map one. And just a few weeks ago in this very chamber, that voice was loud and clear for map one. That map follows the state law most closely, and the redistricting board unanimously pushed that map forward. There are rumblings now that there might be an amendment to push map two, an amendment that ignores the very voices you asked to hear. At that meeting a few weeks ago, it was stated clear that the redistricting board appointed to work on those maps had no data or information on voting districts, but the council president introduced that into the equation by appointing a council member who was fresh off the election trail, where every single vote mattered, and that council member had all of that election data when he sat at the table. With the introduction of the council member's map, gerrymandering was introduced into our process. The council member's map may be the furthest from the state law. I have heard the argument that the council member's proposed the map, the council member's proposed map keeps neighborhoods together. But that criteria, while it might be lofty, is not in the state law nor the city charter. I urge this council to stop this obvious gerrymandering and vote to approve the map that was approved by the redistricting board and show the public that when they speak with an overwhelming voice, it doesn't get dismissed by a council that they voted in to represent that voice. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Carrie McCombs, after Carrie, Leah Beth Zeisler, and then John P. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. And I know that for all of you, regardless of where you sit, this is a very thankless job typically, so I commend all of you. I want to share a story with you first. When I was young, my grandfather served as a town alderman for the last several years of his life, and I promise you there's a point to the story. He always used to tell me, Carrie, keep your side of the street clean. I asked one day what that meant, and to him, in his role as alderman, but also in his life, it meant to be honest, to have integrity, and to support your community with the utmost diligence, among other things. So how this applies tonight. 
In response to a call to action that went out regarding the redistricting, a council member responded with an email on Friday, October 21st, stating that map, 20, that map two was submitted by Heather B.B. Jones. I think I pronounced Stevens. her name. Stevens. I'm Heather sorry. B Heather B.B. Stevens. Yes, thank you. Uh, a member of the redistricting board. It has been publicly disclosed over and over again that map two was submitted by one of your own. So with the council person who responded in this email, either her staff incorrectly advised her, or she fails to keep up on publicly disclosed news, or she promotes deception. And here's how this relates to my story about my grandfather. In any of these cases, this is an example of not keeping your side of the street clean. If you vote to support map two tonight and not the map that was submitted by unanimous recommendation, not only do you directly encourage deceiving the citizens that voted you into the office that you currently hold, you also directly promote gerrymandering and you support violating the state RCW that outlines the clearly defined criteria. And if you ever expect the citizens of this great city to support you and have faith in you, you should consider how well you actually keep your side of the street clean. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, Leah Beth, Usher Leah Beth, John P, and then Tyler, looks like Tyler G. And you can come on down if you're gonna be testifying soon. Hi. Welcome, you have up to three minutes. My name is Leah Beth and I live in Spokane. Um, as a citizen, I appreciate it when my city council actually listens to the community. Every piece of outreach has led to one conclusion. We the people want the unanimously recommended map. So I have one question for you guys. Do you believe in your outreach efforts? It feels as if the outreach efforts are only good when they come to the conclusion you have. When the results don't, suddenly the exact same outreach efforts that have worked have flaws. Yet the outreach efforts seem to only be flawed, specifically when we talk about things like districting or for another example, the siting of a police precinct. I simply ask that you guys be consistent. If these outreach efforts are good enough for issues you agree with, then they should also be good enough for the ones that present with results you don't agree with. Throughout the public process, the public has had the ability to voice their opinion on this issue. In the open public meeting where the committee unanimously selected this map, 32 individuals spoke in favor, and three advocated for another. Please honor the wishes of the community and approve the unanimously recommended map. Thank you. Thank you, Leah Beth. Uh, John P. Oh, Spokane. she was from Spokane. And John P., if you could give us your full name and where you're from, you have up to three minutes. Hi, thanks. Uh, John, John, it's actually Esty, my last name. Uh, City of Spokane, appreciate having the opportunity to, to be here today. Um, I, any, any show of support or vote that for, isn't for MAP1 shows that a complete lack of respect for the process that has played out here today and throughout the last couple months. I mean, if you guys go forward with showing support for a map that isn't map one shows that this entire process was just political theater and you guys have a lack of regard for the process that has played out that you guys have put forward. So I urge you guys to vote for map number one and uh, thanks again for having me. All right. Thanks for coming down, John. Uh, Tyler, I think it's Tyler G. If you could give us your name and where you're from and then Pia Hollenberg, Hollenberg and then we'll probably take a break after Pia. Welcome. My name is Tyler Juliach and I'm from Spokane. Council members, don't spit on me and tell me it's raining. I've heard a lot from this council on what you guys are and are not doing with the woe is me attitude. Frankly, it seems to change depending on where the wind is blowing. Whether it's on homelessness or public safety, you just say whatever makes you look good and wasn't actually good enough. Now I'm being misled again that, oh, the public testimony wasn't actually public or, oh, it wasn't actually good enough. Well, to me, it seems like this whole process was set to fail. To fail the public and to fail our trust in you. People tried to make their voices heard, and that wasn't good enough for one reason or another. So please, go back to supporting Map 1. Neighborhood councils may seem nice, but that's not what this process was designed to do. You are required to make minimal changes, and only one map did that. That was Map 1, and I urge you to support that. Thank you. Thanks for coming down. Uh, Pia Hallenberg. I'm so short. Thank you so much. I'm really sad to see that the commissioners left um, because I would like to thank them for all the work that they've done and also the work that you have put into this discussion. I'm also the first to admit that I'm perhaps not as well prepared and I may have missed a few meetings over the past couple of months, but I am the chair of the Riverside Neighborhood Council. 
And I happen to, sit, to feel that dividing Riverside into three different districts is not a delight, as someone put it. Um, downtown Spokane is a different neighborhood council, different neighborhood than any of the residential neighborhoods in the city. I live here, I live a couple of blocks that way, I work here, my office is in the Paulson building, and if you divide the downtown neighborhood council into three different districts, you have efficiently put a nail in it. We might as well pack up and go home. It's difficult enough to activate those who live downtown when there's a plethora of organizations. There's a DSP, there's the, the PDF or the PFD or whoever they are. There are so many organizations that are clamoring for power over downtown. I understand that there are political reasons behind wanting power over downtown. We have never resisted any of that as a neighborhood council, but I would like for you all to consider to please look at this from the neighborhood standpoint. It is not easy for us to work with a bunch of different council members. It's hard enough as it is. And that's really all I wanna to say tonight. Please take into consideration the neighborhood councils. That system in and of itself is fairly flawed and fairly inefficient as it is. I know we're low on the totem pole when it comes to power in the city. We have no power really, except what we get from our members on the city council. So please consider as you move forward to keep the neighborhood councils together. It's not just nice. It is something that makes the city coherent and it helps the neighbors work together to address the issues that happen right outside of our doors like we're supposed to. Um, and again, I'm, I'm sorry that the commissioners are not here anymore because they put a lot of work into this and I wanna thank them for that. Thank you so much. All right, we're gonna take about a 10 minute break. So we'll be back at 8.25. So we're temporarily in recess and when we come back, David Heiser is up, then Patty Shadden and then Tom Clark.
All right, we're good. All right, we're back on the record. And uh, just a couple of things. So first of all, we have still 24 people signed up to talk about just this topic, which will probably take us to 930, which we usually end. And so now not all the people may still be here, but that puts the possibility of open forum at risk. So um, just for those of you who are waiting around for that, there's, it's unlikely that we'll get to that, but um, you're welcome to stay on that. Uh, secondly, I just wanted to give, I should have done this at the beginning, but just give a little um, summary on the process, on the, how the redistricting process works. We have the redistricting commission, which finished its work on October 4th. They pass on their recommendation to the council. We publish that uh, with plenty of time uh, for people to get notice of that for this meeting. And then we have another meeting on November 7th where we're gonna take a final vote. Um, unless, the only reason we wouldn't is if we tried to make an amendment to it on the 7th, but our lawyers told us that even then we wouldn't have enough notice. So the council can make an amendment tonight um, or it could hold a special meeting to make an amendment, but uh, absent doing so before the 7th, the 7th will be the final vote on this. So with that, I think I called out before, David Heiser, if you're here, and after David, Patty Shadden, and then Tom Clark. There's David. Welcome to City Council. We have up to three minutes. Thank you, as you stated, my name's David Heiser. Born and raised here in Spokane, currently living in Chatteroy. Worked for the city of Spokane for 29 years. So I understand the redistricting occurs every five to 10 years. The Citizens Committee was formed. Two members of the council were on that committee. The committee came up with what was considered fair district boundaries, map one. I also understand the alternative map submitted are not the, or that you are considering, map two is not the one submitted by them. Some of the boundaries on the alternate map would appear are designed to scare a stronger voting base for certain council positions. These changes could allow for, at best, a narrow margin of victory in some areas. The system would allow for a minority of the population to gain control over the majority through manipulation of the district boundaries. Oxford Dictionary defines manipulation as the action of manipulating something in a skillful manner or the action of manipulating someone in a clever and unscrupulous way. Changing the boundaries submitted from the original map for political gain is both clever and unscrupulous. This is not representing the people of Spokane. It is showing the true motto of some people, if I can't win fairly, I will cheat. The job of the city council is not to impose their will on the citizens, it is to represent them. If the members of the council if, as members of the council, you have to cheat and manipulate things in order to get reelected, then you're not representing the citizens of Spokane. If you are doing your job and representing the will of the people that elected you in the first place, your reelection would be a sure thing. The original map was drawn without political motivation and meetings and met all the criteria set forth by the revised codes of Washington. There is no reason this map should not be used for redistricting. If the committee's original map is not used, it will only go to show that anyone that supported the alternate map does not care about fairly representing the people of Spokane, but strictly care about maintaining their seat at all costs, so that they may continue to misrepresent the majority while pushing their political agenda through manipulation. Thanks for coming down, David. Uh, is Patty Shadden here? She comes, and after Patty, Tom Clark, and then Tom Bassler. You can pull that right down. Yeah, we want to hear you. <laughs> thank you. Welcome. You've much. got up to three minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, my name's Patty Shadden. I'm from North Indian Trail Neighborhood Council. Well, no, I'm not on the council. I live in that neighborhood. I think we're muddying the waters when we're trying to integrate two different entities here. Uh, neighborhood council has a function that's unique and 
a purpose that doesn't always mesh with the city council, but they should be able to work on um, issues and solutions that all the people in that neighborhood can um, address in two different forums. I see nothing wrong with that. I don't think they have to be meshed uh, in their districts. Um, after our, the October 4th gathering, which I attended and spoke to this issue, um, there was grumbling that maybe that the online survey was um, not imperfect. And so I came up with a petition about this redistricting. And this paper represents 600 people. There were more than that that responded, but these are the ones that are in the Spokane City, uh, within the Spokane City, who agree with what our, your commission came up with, that they thought that, that map number one most clearly defined the objectives that the state asked for you to accomplish uh, with this. Uh, th so this is kind of a control group, and it confirms support for map number one. It's com map number one is com compact, equitable, that's a big word that everybody uses, Redistri and it redistributes the cons constituents evenly in the different districts, and I would like to represent these people in asking that the board stick with what the commission um, recommended in voting for map number one. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Council President. Yeah. Just real quick, if, if there's a, a survey there, is that something that can be entered into the public record that can be shared with us? Um, this is a petition. I don't know, but we sure could, I, I, I guess. I don't know what the rules and regulations are on that. Well, if, if you have a digital copy, you could just submit it to council. We'd just love to see it. Sure. That'd be great. Will do. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Patty, Tom Clark, come on up, Tom, and then Tom Bassler, and then Irene Galvin. Hi, I'm Tom Clark. Uh, thank you all very, very much for your time, energy, efforts in, uh, for the city of Spokane. I live in Spokane Valley. I'm a stone's throw away from the city of Spokane, uh, but <clears throat> when I bought, I didn't realize where I was going to be, and I found out I'm in the, in the valley. I do pay taxes on three properties in Spokane, so perhaps I have a, a dog in the fight. So uh, let me talk to you a little bit about uh, my history. I'm with the Spokane Association of Realtors. I've been a realtor for 30 years. Um, as, an, as a business owner and an independent contractor and someone who's made their living in Spokane for 30 years, um, there are certain things that, that I protect with everything, and one of them is my reputation. My reputation means everything to me. Reputation with the public, reputation with people I run into, reputation with my clients, that's how I make a living. I say that because uh, just the thought of possible impropriety or conflict of interest or uh, any other accusations that we've heard here today is a concern of mine. It's a big concern of mine. It'd be something that would be very personal to me if I were in your shoes so, or, or in your seat. So, uh, I say that, and, and I say that because the, the redistricting board uh, recommended map one. Uh, we've heard several opinions of, of different reasons to like or dislike it, or to like or dislike another one. If you trust the process, you let the process work. The redistricting board had a job. They did their job. They've made a recommendation, and I think in, in light of protecting your reputations and protecting the sanctity of the process, that map one is your only choice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. And Tom Bassler, come on up. Irene Galvin after Tom, and then Brian Burrow. And Brian, uh, thanks uh, for listening to me. Um, Spokane, I work on First Street. Um, I go to the move downtown. My kids went to G Prep and Cataldo. Uh, I love Spokane. Um, I support MAP1, I support the uh, unanimous, de unanimous decision of the redistricting board, and I, I'll just address, I, I, I'm just confused by the neighborhood council division. The neighborhood councils were formed to increase communication of the neighborhoods to the city councils. And 
being on in different voting districts doesn't divide them. Just as if my neighborhood had one post office and they built a second post office, my neighborhood is not divided. We're still a neighborhood. If I have a neighborhood council, they still can communicate to you guys. In fact, it should help in the communication because now instead of just two of you guys, they can talk to four. Best of all, it makes their voice stronger because they can actually vote for you. They're a council, their job is communication, so they can bring in twice the number of other council uh, members. So they'll have twice the allies. They can communicate to twice the number of you guys. They can vote for twice. I don't understand why they're complaining. They get actually an advantage. Anyway, so if I was working for the city and a city council member came to me with that concern, I would actually explain, no, it's not a concern. You know, you have now twice a chance to find a council member that will actually listen to you and actually support you. That's the tough thing, is finding a, an ally on the city council to support your interests. And if I was in two, I'd have twice the shot although I probably would still get no support, but I do my best. And I want to thank you guys. You guys do communicate really well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Irene, Galvin, and then Irene, after Irene, Brian Burrow, and then Josh, looks like Hoke, H-O-C-H maybe. Welcome. Hello, good evening. My name is Candy Galvan. Irene is my legal first name. I live in the city of Spokane. Um, thank you for this opportunity, Councilman Beggs and the rest of you. Uh, it's incredible that we have to come down here again to ask you to please listen to the overwhelming public fee feedback you've had re um, asking you to support Map 1. Map 1 is the map that most clearly follows the state laws by keeping the districts as compact as possible and it balances the population and has the fewest changes as possible. When you put up the RCW up there, I did not see anything about neighborhood council. Um, I see the convenience of that, but the letter of the law is what we're after here. And that is why the redistricting board voted for map number one. The results of the survey favored map number one. There were four maps 65%, as I recall, favored map number one. And I also recall, I believe, that there were a couple of other maps that were more neighborhood-based, but since those were thrown out, I don't see why we ended up discussing map number two. The people who attended the last redistricting hearing, I think that was October 4th, almost unanimously spoke in favor of map number one and against map number two. The neighborhood councils are non-political and should not affect how political districts are drawn. Map number two is presented by a city council member is unfairly drawn and has a conflict of interest. It has unnatural boundaries. It is drawn using gerrymandering boundaries, which intentional or not, disenfranchise many, many, many of us who already feel unrepresented by the majority of city council. It is a blatant, it seems to me, a blatant political ploy and a power grab that will create a city council completely lacking in diversity of opinion. Please do the right thing. Listen to the overwhelming support for map number one and adopt it into law. Thank you. Thanks, Candy. Um, Brian Burrow, and then Josh, and then Darren Watkins. Good evening, Good evening Council President and uh, Council Members. My name is Brian Burrow. I'm a resident of the uh, City of Spokane. A healthy, well-functioning City Council should mirror the community it serves. When I look at our community, I see diversity in gender and age, skin color, financial status, passions, and yes, party preferences. In fact, Spokane is roughly 55% Democrat and 45% Republican. Shouldn't the council somewhat mirror what the city looks like? As an economist and a lifelong resident and a former city council candidate of District 3, I can attest that process is being broken and ethical boundaries are being crossed that would have significant effect for years to come. Currently, a conservative-leaning candidate has a fighting chance to win an election in District 3. 
The map proposed by the redistricting, redistricting Commission preserves that fairness. The alternative map pr proposed tips the scales in the favor of one party over another so far that races that were once nail biters coming down to a couple hundred votes would no longer exist. Instead, that same race would result in a landslide victory by the council member who pro proposed the new map. I don't want to go so far as to call this type of decision corrupt, but it is certainly a conflict of interest and unethical and a textbook case of gerrymandering. I'd like to thank the members of the appointed redistricting commission for the long hours and hard work that they put in and urge the council to adopt map one as proposed unanimously by the commission. Thanks for your time tonight. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Josh, and then Darren, and then Laverne Beal. And if you could pronounce your name for me, because I wasn't quite sure how you to You actually say. got it right, it's Hoke. So, okay. Yeah, my name's Joshua Hoke, I'm a resident of Spokane. Um, I just wanna please, please uh, urge you guys to stop politicizing the little things. Uh, every time registration comes up, uh, whether it be on the national, state, or local level, we always hear about gerrymandering and the support of one party over another. I would hope that my city can rise above this. Um, we are bombarded constantly by, with deci decisive rhetoric and politics, and we don't need that um, more of that in Spokane within the de redistricting process. I recommend the redistricting board's decision to recommend a simple map that made minimal changes and closely aligns the po populations of the three council districts. The city council needs to honor that recommendation and no fur not further politicize this process. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. All right, Darren Watkins, come on up. Laverne Beal. And then after that is Gina McKenzie, I think. Thank you, Council President. My name is Darren Watkins. I am a member of the city limits of Spokane. Um, perhaps a more important question you might have posed is whether or not I'm a registered member of any political party. And in this case, I can tell you that I am firmly agnostic when it comes to politics. Both sides drive me crazy. I will say this, though, uh, as a matter of practice, that I have been asked here to speak on behalf of the Spokane Association of Realtors, 2,500 realtors that work either work or live within the city limits and have a vested interest in here. And the commentary is based on this. Gerrymandering is the greatest threat to our democracy because it pushes parties to their extremes. Those are the words of former President Barack Obama, who has now dedicated much of his life since running the country to now battling back against the very issue that we are talking about tonight. How is that possible? Well, before you are basically two maps. We've been labeled, we've changed the names of them, but let's consider what the two maps do. Map number two, let's call it, essentially cherry picks a number of the richest Democratic districts and precincts and slides them into District 3. It changes the configuration from a plus 1.5 to a plus 7.5. It is at the very simplest, the facts are clear, this is gerrymandering. Something that's clearly to an advantage of someone who perhaps won their last election by 1.3% of the vote. So now the question becomes this. Voting for map number two asks you to make some monumental decisions and make monumental errors at the same time. First, it asks you to ignore the work that was done by a bipartisan committee formed by state and local policy. It asks you to, uh, this map number one, they picked because it had the least amount of political influence. Voting map two asks you to turn your back on the people of your district. As President Obama once said, voters should pick their politicians. Politicians should not pick their voters. It also requires you to support this notion of extremism. So tonight, this will be a vote of character. Do you pick what's best for people? Or do you pick what's best for your party? People versus party. The choice is yours. Thanks, Darren. Uh, Laverne Beal, and after Laverne is Gina McKenzie, and then Jeff Fix. Thank you, Council President and Council Members. I'm Laverne Beal, representing East Central. 
Thank you for encouraging face-to-face -face interaction. This is important in the bottom-up approach to our government. This great bottom-up government experiment that we're all involved in encourages meaning dialogue, promotes new ideas, generates participation, and advances growth. It allows for keen listening, advances thought, and quite frankly, the results are that we have a chance to listen to other people's voices instead of the voices in our own head. There have been concerns raised about splitting neighborhoods and, and their boundaries. East Central's boundaries have been split for years, for as long as I can remember. The East Central area has flourished in spite of this split, and because we quickly realized, just as what was reported earlier, that we have four sitting council members instead of two. We have learned to work within our boundaries, and we have thrived. The bottom-up government allows individuals surveys, group participation, compromises, and insights that we may not have considered. Allow this bottom-up government to work the way it was designed and intended. Trust the process. Please vote on the recommendations given by the redistricting committee to map one. Trust the process and trust the people. Thank you. Thanks, Laverne. And Gina McKenzie is here, and then Jeff Fix, and then Gabe Hernandez. Good evening, and thank you, <clears throat> President Beggs and council members. It's good to live in America and be able to express a person's opinion freely without a do negative repercussions. I'll keep this short because it's a long meeting, and um, we've heard over and over this pretty much the same thing that uh, on October 4th I was here and heard, which is the majority of people that you represent want to go with MAP1, and that was the recommendation from the uh, redistricting board. And I should say that um, I'm just, I'm representing my own opinion tonight. I will keep this very short, but I am a realtor also. I've been on nearly 40 years and also nearly 40 years on and off uh, member of the uh, Emerson Garfield Neighborhood uh, Council. So um, I'm just gonna say ditto to um, asking that you honor the process and go with MAP1. And um, thank you, good night. Thanks for coming down, Gina. Jeff Fix, and after Jeff, Gabe Hernandez, and then Jim Dawson. Thank you for having me here. Um, the chairman started off tonight, he said uh, he was disappointed to hear of accusations of gerrymandering and uh, unethical um, activities within the committee. Um, and I just want to start off saying I, I was extremely disappointed too. I saw the Inlander article and um, I was thinking this, this isn't, you know, this isn't local government. This is what we see on, on national television, but this isn't uh, what's best for the people of Spokane and what we, sh and what we should expect out of our uh, local leaders here. But I wanted to uh, look into it and find my own opinion on it. I didn't want to immediately get angry. I didn't want to immediately jump to conclusions. Um, so I did some searching and here's what I found. Um, Council Member Zappone, or Councilman Zappone, has uh, proposed a map that would give precinct so, three. I don't know if you remember, we kind of covered this before. You can just say a council member proposed it, but we're trying not to single out sure. individual names. Okay. So. Um, a council member proposed a map uh, in which he would give uh, precinct 3316 to a different district uh, and then absorb precinct 3200 and then parts of 3201 and 3222. Uh, precinct 3316 that he proposes he gives to a different district. Uh, he won by only 34 votes, making it pretty close. The other three precincts, of course, he's never run in because they're not currently part of his district. Uh, but just to search for a pattern, uh, Council President Beggs won all three of these precincts by over 160 votes, and Mayor Woodward lost all three of these precincts by over 150 votes. Uh, I certainly see a pattern here. I, I'm sure everyone else does too. Uh, I kept trying to figure out why certain members uh, are prioritizing 
uh, neighborhood councils, especially unelected neighborhood councils over the state RCW, uh, as well as the one downtown neighborhood uh, Riverside Council that uh, for some reason that one does not uh, get prioritized to stay altogether. Um, but now the reasons seem clear to me, uh, and I would say I'm disgusted to say the least, and hopefully the other members of the city council can see through this act. Thank you for your time. Thanks for coming down, Jeff. Gabe Hernandez and Jim Dawson and Nick Nikki Lockwood. Yeah, thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Gabe Hernandez. I live in Spokane. I would just like to echo what many have said tonight to adopt map number one. We're just telling you to follow the process and listen to the redistricting commission and um, the map they voted for. Substituting maps for whichever one meets your political interest does not meet the spirit of redistricting in Washington state. And with this, I would like to urge you to vote for map number one. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you on behalf of everyone else who wants to speak for keeping it short. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Jim Dawson, and after Jim is Nikki Lockwood, and then Susan Vernick. Thank you. My name is Jim Dawson. I live in the East Central neighborhood in Spokane, Washington, and I'm speaking uh, in support of the community feedback that was received during the process of keeping neighborhoods together and having a split downtown uh, because all the neighborhoods are impacted by downtown. And um, I want to point out a couple of different things. Um, our neighborhood has been active in trying to right the wrongs of the past. Um, we were working with the state legislature to address the harms that the North-South Freeway has done to our neighborhood and the I-90 uh, going right through the middle of it. And they have uh, attempted to right some wrongs. And uh, splitting East Central, which has been probably the most impacted neighborhood of any neighborhood in our city, um, across two districts, does dilute our power and presence. That is the nature of dividing a group, <laughs> right? Um, divide and conquer is kind of the rule in politics. So when you divide a neighborhood, it means you have less influence with any of your elected officials, even though you have more of them. And that's why neighborhoods want to be united. So we have a history of East Central um, of being uh, a poor neighborhood, a neighborhood with a lot of diversity and with people of color that has been divided by multiple different uh, actions of the government. And um, keeping the status quo perpetuates those harms. And you have an opportunity tonight to uh, not vote for the status quo, to address the harms of the past that has happened to East Central and other neighborhoods that are divided currently and unite them. And MAP2 is the only one that does all of those things. Um, and I hope that you'll support MAP2. And I also want to point out that um, I find it quite funny that when they say the people has, have spoken, because the people who came out to that hearing were mobilized by the mayor who sent an alert to their, her Republican supporters. The, a lot of the folks that are speaking tonight are the same special interests who have spent record amounts of money trying to buy Northwest Spokane City Council elections and Northeast Spokane and who helped to put the mayor in office. So we're talking about the realtors and developers who have been spending record amounts the last two election cycles. They are mobilizing to get a map that protects their political special interests they're the ones who came out and um, flooded the, the last hearing, and that is what you're hearing. That's not the people speaking. That's partisan special interests and big developers speaking, trying to protect their political agenda at the objection of all the neighborhoods who did speak out in support of a uh, united neighborhoods and a shared downtown, and MAP2 is the only map that does that. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming down, Jim. Nikki Lockwood, and after Nikki is Susan Vernig and Jeff Bolak. Hello, Council President, President Beggs and Council Members. Um, I'm here tonight as a resident in the East Central neighborhood of Spokane asking you to consider Map 2 for redistricting. And I'd first like to thank you for this transparent process where you put things on your agenda and make space for public comment. I know it's your usual practice, but nonetheless, I thank you for that. I appreciate the work of the redistricting committee in narrowing it down to four maps and giving you their recommendation. I'm asking you to consider that map two is the only one that would unite several neighborhoods. 
which is in line with state law. As the East Central neighborhood, like so many diverse communities across our country, were divided back when the freeways came in, I see this as an opportunity to unite this neighborhood. That so many were told pointedly to specifically oppose this map concerns me and seems very political. I, for one, want to acknowledge the historic and systemic racism inflicted on this neighborhood, East Central specifically, and therefore voting for vote map two allows the chance to strengthen this neighborhood and is a step towards healing historic wrongs. I can tell you from my public role and actions I've taken, um, when we are brave and take action centered in those most impacted, we strengthen our communities and have, that have been negatively impacted and we're a stronger city. In my public role as a school board director, I was proud to take the lead of a young female student of color asking that we change the name of Sheridan Elementary, it's in my neighborhood, whose name was tarnished with the history of violence against natives. I was proud to vote to approve naming the elementary in this historically black East Central neighborhood after Frances Scott, a local black female educator who was also the first black female attorney in Spokane, who worked on civil rights cases after school in her free time. I was proud to take a step towards healing and acknowledge the community that elementary school serves. I am asking you to use your power and understanding of the history of our city to unite and not divide. In the words of Francis Scott, you were there, well, what did you do about it? I'm asking you to pick map two. Uh, thank you again for serving our community. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, Susan Bernig, after Susan Jeff Bullock, and then Tyler, maybe Coronia. Hi, Susan. Hi. Good evening, City Council Beggs and City Council members. My name is Susan Vernig, and I was the co founder of Northwest Regional Facilitators, a local nonprofit, in 1974. In January 1975, we were hired as the citizen participation consultant to the city of Spokane for the brand new community development block grant program. I personally went door to door in the East Central neighborhood to interest residents in participating in this new process and to ask them to share the needs of the neighborhood. One thing became clear immediately and that was the damage done to the neighborhood 18 years before by the freeway, I-90, being built right through the middle of the neighborhood, and by it destroying most of Liberty Park, which had been on a par with Manitou Park. In 1977, my spouse, Bob Stilger, and I bought a home in the East Central neighborhood and have been neighborhood residents ever since for these past 45 years. I have to tell you that as young white professionals with excellent credit, we had to go to 12 banks before the last one, Washington Mutual, would even consider giving us a mortgage. Why was that? As I went from bank to bank, I was told, we'd love to have you as a customer, if only you'd be willing to buy a home 10 blocks further up the South Hill. And no house in that neighborhood could possibly be worth what you're willing to pay for it. And come back to us if you change your mind about where you want to live. Redlining, the banking practice that destroyed neighborhoods. In 1978, our nonprofit was hired by the city to pilot a home rehab program in the East Central neighborhood. And I can still remember my visit to the very first person to apply, Emery Barnhill. Hearing his story and many others who applied, the tragedy of Redline became apparent. The only way homes could be sold was by contract. The only way a leaking roof or a major electrical problem could be fixed was if the contractor would carry a contract so the home could be repaired. Why am I telling you all this? After the travesty of the freeway destroying the neighborhood and the travesty of redlining adding to the destruction, it is highly inappropriate for you to continue this pattern of dividing the East Central neighborhood. Others have been clear about the problems with Map 1 and the problems with the outreach efforts and the process which resulted in it. I urge you not 
to follow in the footsteps of policies that have damaged this neighborhood over Susan. many years and instead to choose map two. Thanks for coming down. Thank you. Jeff Bolak and then Tyler, again, Coronia, and then Joanna Cable. Hello, everybody. Jeff Bolak, resident of Spokane, and very, very happy with that because I'm transplant from Spokane Valley. It's a unique place, unique place. So I know, obviously, though, how I felt when people from Spokane came and talked about things. Not happy. But one of the things I did notice as I've come here, a lot of doom and gloom, a lot of talks about super corruption on the council. And it does not seem to me as if the sky is falling right now. That is not what things seem to appear. It, we, are, we are literally discussing maps that change percentages on elections by honestly no more than two to three percent, which yes, I, as some of you may know, I do maps myself on the political realm. It's not going to change things a whole lot realistically. And furthermore, I think a lot of this discussion about partisanship one direction or another has been in a lot of ways very disingenuous in the sense of there are people on who have been adamantly supporting map one which was promoted by the Spokane Republican Party, was activated. They were pushing people out through multiple emails. And that's where a lot of that advocacy came from. And I heard things that were quite wild to me of people saying they're more connected with their precinct than they are their neighborhood council, which surprises me because I've never heard someone in my precinct say, let's go party 6316. It just seems to not happen, oddly enough. <laughs> I don't know why that is, but it just doesn't seem to happen. So, but when I hear people saying that we need to be more connected to our precincts than our neighborhood councils, that seems very surprising to me, having been in politics overall. Now, furthermore though, we, I, that's really where I wanna get to for supporting map two in this process. Because one of the things I think we have seen is that politics has run amok. And I do feel sorry for the people that made maps three and four, because obviously they no longer count, they no longer exist in any way, shape, or form. Um, it's only maps one and two. And I, so I think what this does show though is at the point politics came into this, this did become an either or debate. There's no real, either A, you support map one and you've got the Republicans. Map two, evidently you're engaging in corruption of saxophone, which to me seems just absurd. Because it really, when you get down to it, doesn't seem like that's how things are. But we do see a lot of groups coming out support one way or the other, and I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the fact Labor Council's executive board, the Spokane Regional Labor Council's executive board is supporting MAP2. Um, so which, again, I think that is an area, a group that also does, our laborers are important, as are our realtors, as are everyone else. We should have our opinions heard. Um, I really let this get away from myself, but I want to thank you all, and I strongly urge support for MAP2 because it is what unites the neighborhoods, ends redlining, and makes up for a lot of problems we have had in the past. Thank you. Thank you for being very entertaining. And thank you for making us smile. And, <laughs> and if I don't see a social media post about a 6316 party in the next week, I'm going to be very upset. <laughs> yeah. I'm not by PCO, so I mean, <laughs> All right, Tyler, come on up and uh, please pronounce your last name for me. You got it correct, Coronia. Uh, okay. Great. State law requires that there be minimal changes uh, to the district lines, only redrawing them to adjust uh, for equal populations. I am pleased the redistricting board unanimously voted to recommend map number one. Uh, then I see on social media uh, that members of this council majority don't like what the majority of people in Spokane want, so they're just going to do what they want anyway. Your attempts to discredit the input you received is embarrassing. Just because you don't like input doesn't mean the input is not valid. Uh, please adopt map number one and adjust the populations uh, of our city council district with minimal changes. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tyler. And then we're gonna have Joanna Cable and then we're gonna do a couple phone people and then we're getting close to the end. So is Joanna here or not? All right, not seeing Joanna. All right, we're gonna try to go through some phone people. There's, we have several signed up, but only a couple appear to be on the line. So um, I'm gonna start with Joseph Perry. Joseph, if you're there, if you could hit star three. Going once, twice, three times, Joseph. I know it's been long. Come back and see us. Oh, 
All right. Joseph, are you there? Is that Hello, you? Council President. Can you hear me? Yeah, is this Joseph? Yes, this is. Yeah, Joseph, welcome to City Council. Thanks for your patience. You've got up to three minutes. Thank you so much. Um, good evening, Council President. Good evening, Council Members. My name is Joseph Perry. I live in Perry District in District 2 in the City of Spokane. I'm calling in tonight to support Map 2, uh, Neighborhood Council Boundaries in a Shared Downtown. As we've heard a lot tonight, this is not the map that the redistricting board recommended to you. And honestly, I'm personally confused why. In August, before this process came anywhere near the political limelight, the Spokane Redistricting Board put out a survey to gather public, unbiased, non-political responses to a simple question. What would you like the redistricting board members to consider when making the boundary adjustment? To the survey, they got 155 responses, and as mentioned by the board themselves, the overwhelming theme of these comments, unbiased, non-political, was the importance of keeping neighborhoods whole in the council districts. So that's what one of the directives the board had. But the map proposed to you ignores that directive directly. Um, and it ignores the responses of that survey. And as we've heard plenty tonight, there is a proposed map that does follow that directive, map two. In map two, not one single neighborhood has, is split between two different districts. Why is that important? Well, we heard a lot about it today. We've heard from neighborhood council leaders themselves. Um, and as one of the gentlemen before me came uh, and mentioned, a lot of people talking about their precincts and why they're important over their neighborhood councils. Um, but that is rather absurd to me. Um, Spokane prides itself on its really strong neighborhoods and the neighborhood identities that we all hold. Um, keeping neighborhoods together is very important. It allows neighborhoods uh, to connect with their leaders, to connect with their city council members uh, in order to achieve their goals in making their communities better. Dividing them only serves to confuse this process, make it more difficult, and make it confusing to who they should reach out to to get help. I urge you, council president, all the council members, to look at the unbiased, non-political responses that the, district, the redistricting board asked for before any of this became political, as it shouldn't be. The directive was clear, keep neighborhoods uh, intact and not split between two different districts. So I urge you to consider map two, as that's the only one put forth to you that does so. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Joseph. And if you could hit star three and lower your hand, and then Sean Gannon, if you're there, if you can hit star three to raise your hand. All right, Sean, welcome to City Council. Hello, I am a resident of North Spokane, and I'd like to speak in support of Map 2, the only map that keeps our neighborhoods intact. Map 2 would ensure that families, uh, neighbors, uh, communities would have more of a say in the issues that affect us at a local level. And I know from friends and folks in the East Central neighborhood that they feel like their neighborhood has less influence in Spokane because they're split across two different council districts. I think that we should be doing what we can to empower the East Central neighborhood, which Map 2 does, and not continue to erode its influence as Map 1 certainly would. And then one last thing I'd note, Map 2 really does not change our, um, our districts as much as some have said tonight, 95% of city residents would stay in their same district with MAP2, 95%. MAP2 does propose uh, minimal changes to our districts. Only one in 20 residents would find themselves in a different district with MAP2, one in 20. It is incredibly hyperbolic and frankly, quite irresponsible to call this gerrymandering. I urge you to support MAP2, to support our neighborhoods, Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Have a nice night. Thank you, Sean. Uh, if you could hit star three and lower your hand. And then Jeff DeBray, if you're out there, if you could hit star three to raise your hand. Jeff, welcome to Spokane City Council. 
Are you there? Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Jeff Dubray, and I moved to Spokane in 2014 to attend Whitworth University. I've since spent the past five years organizing and advocating to build a city for all of us, uh, one for young people, our LGBTQ plus community, people of color, and those experiencing homelessness. I live in District 2 in the East Central neighborhood, one of the most diverse parts of our city, and have called this neighborhood home for nearly two years and Spokane home for nearly a decade. I have some serious concerns about the redistricting proposal map number one because it divides our neighborhood. Map number one is the only map that divides East, Cent East Central with little consultation for the residents of East Central itself. We are one of the most economically and racially diverse neighborhoods in our region, and choosing to, to divide this part of our city, a part that is home for many immigrants, refugees, and communities of color, is not simply a decision of convenience, but one that causes long-term harm to many of the folks we value and love in Spokane. Many of these communities we have not heard from tonight, but who deserve a voice in this process. Growing up in a family myself that struggled to make ends meet, I know firsthand how isolation and division only fuel further isolation and division, and believe this is something none of us here tonight want for Spokane. Finally, this map proposal demonstrates the Spokane Redistricting Board is not representative of Spokane, as the board failed to do sufficient community outreach to engage all people in the process. Our neighborhood has said before, and when it comes to changes in our community without equitable outreach, nothing about us without us. Nothing about us without us. I want to ensure this final map represents the voices and interests of the whole city, not just the loudest and the wealthiest ones. I urge you to support map two. Thank you. Thank you. If you could hit star three and lower your hand. And then if Christine Lowe, if you're still there, if you could hit star three to raise your hand. Christine, are you there? Star three? Okay. All right. I don't think Christine is still there. And then I think I had one call out to Joanna Cable. Joanna Cable, not there. Paul Dillon, and then Ryan Roller. Good evening, City Council. Um, my name is Paul Dillon. I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs at Planned Parenthood of Greater Washington, North Idaho, and I'm a resident of East Central. Uh, I'm in here in support of Map 2, which unites neighborhoods like mine, which have long been divided. Uh, as a former legislative assistant in District 2 who would respond to constituents and attend neighborhood council meetings, I can personally attest to how confusing these shared boundaries were, which is why I'm excited that MAP2 strengthens council representation by making sure that each neighborhood has only two council members. Uh, this summer, we saw the conflict over the East Central Library where there was a communication breakdown about neighborhood safety and what was best for the neighborhood while council member Wilkerson was left out of a conversation that was happening in her own district. And I really must say, I feel like most folks in East Central don't even know this is happening. Sadly, the process was flawed from the start. It started late. We know qualified candidates applied. The mayor's office didn't get back to them or they were rejected. And of course, once the maps were presented, the mayor then reached out to her campaign list to recruit opposition to map two, which is why we're hearing so much of the misinformation tonight. District maps, as with all government services and entities, should serve the people, not a well-funded political establishment. This is about neighborhoods, not partisan politics. And no, this is not a power grab, which has become the lazy catch-all phrase anytime this council does, well, anything. By contrast, Map 1 intentionally kept East Central divided reinforcing decades of systemic racism that erodes black and brown voices and represent representation in Spokane. Simply put, Map 1 does not best represent Spokane. And we've heard a lot about state law tonight, but state law says that district lines should be drawn to keep communities of interest together. 
And I can almost hear what Sandy Williams might say about this latest attempt to divide East Central. Now we have an opportunity for positive change. So before you make a decision, I hope you can all ask yourself, what would Sandy say? Thank you. Thanks, Paul. And I'm thinking you're Ryan. <laughs> Thanks, you're the last one. Thanks, come on down. Welcome to City Council, Ryan. Thank you. So my name is Ryan Roller, and I'm just a dude, a dude who knows the law and has read the state law that guides the redistricting process. It clearly states that populations of each district should be made as evenly as possible and with, and with as little change as possible. This is what the professionals just said, too. And I was pleased to see that the commission, that the commission voted to recommend the map that did, that did just that, map number one. I recognize that no map is perfect, but to me, map number one most followed the letter of the law. So good on the commission for picking that. But now here we are. And it seems to all of us that there's this process to undermine that whole process that, that the professionals made and recommend a map that does, or and recommend a map that reopens the discussion to this whole different dealio. This is like me going to the doctor and him telling me that I should lose weight and me not listening to the professionals. It does not make sense to me. Why do we have a step-by-step -step process for redistricting if we're not going to be following the law itself? Therefore, God bless Daniel Walters for calling out this ridiculous power grab that's happening today. I'm tired of seeing this council rule like they have a mandate. At least three of you are up there that won by less than 100, excuse me, less, less than 1,000 votes. And two of your seats were actually won by less than 500 votes. But not for long, though, because we keep making these ma maps different. So it'd just be easier for people to win. It's truly unbelievable that I have to come here and explain why this doesn't pass a smell test to us. It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, last time I checked, we're not living in some dystopia. We're living in a place where lines are drawn for a reason. And so I want you guys to listen to the people, of the, in the, what the people of the public want, which is map number one, which is being said all day. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Ryan. All right, that brings us to the end of testimony on this first reading ordinance. Councilmember Wilkerson. Council President, I'd like to put forth a substitution to map one and to substitute map two. And I am putting forth that because contrary to what's been said, I really am putting people over party. The suggestion that people are not intelligent enough to vote their political views it really should be offensive. Communities and neighborhoods is what's important in District 2. And all these neighborhoods that would be split are in District 2. I've heard from District 2. And this is the step they want to go forward with. So I submit the substitution that was filed today uh, before 1 o'clock. I have May a question. I clarify the motion real quick. Is it to substitute with the new version of the, the ordinance? Version. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Hanalee. I'm first going to check for a second. Oh, I'll second. Okay. Councilmember Stratton. I just want to check to see. We don't take a final vote on this no. until no. next week. The 7th, two weeks. Seventh. The 7th. Is there any way that you would be willing to hold that until the 7th? We can't. We can't do that. We can't do it the night of the 7th? No. We can. We just have to hold a hearing on the 14th. But no, we won't have enough days. Of, I do. That's what, yeah, that's not Mr. quite Pic enough well, Let's time. let Mr. Piccolo just. That's pretty clear. <laughs> I can't. So, okay. Yes, yeah, state law provides that if you amend the proposed plan, you have to go back out and publish that, uh, give notice to the public one week before your decision the following Monday. So if you wait until the 7th that evening, to make an amendment, then you're not going to make that one week, I'm afraid you're not going to make that one week uh, requirement to, to publish that, uh, again, one week before your decision. It, it's, it's, it could be just a matter of hours or minutes, but I would not want to put the council in that position uh, to create a legal challenge to your decision. So if there is an amendment tonight, we can publish that, uh, give the public notice, and it'll be actually more than the required seven days. One week, it'll be close to 10 days, or if not more. So if you make the amendment tonight, we can meet, we can meet that requirement. We can, 
do the outreach on it. Yes. And if we decide to change our minds, is there enough, I mean, do we have to have another hearing at that point? Can we roll it back or would we be too late? I think you are, you, you, you have to have the, the proposed plan before the voters, before the public. And there's, there can be just one from my read of the statute. But if we amend it tonight and then two weeks come back and say, you know what, we're going to change that, is, is that too late to do that? Mm -hmm. So effectively, the, the, the yes. decision has to be made tonight. Yes. So tonight is essentially the vote. Right. Okay. You will have another hearing on the 7th and the vote that evening. But that's just for show because we can't change it at that point, correct? Correct, because we, we have come right up against the deadline. If we were back in August right now, we would have more flexibility, but because we're in late October with the November 15th deadline, we are up against the, that, that tight deadline. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Other council commentary? <clears throat> Councilmember Bingo. I guess we could do all, all our commentary here at this point, right? Yeah. You know, so yeah, why not? Okay. Yeah, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back through the, the state law. I know it, it keeps coming up, but I think it's a really important point. So I'm going to pull this up real quick again, and uh, we'll go over it. So when it comes to the RCWs, when you're looking at um, the requirements that are given, the ones that are given first before the rest are the ones that uh, the state legislature has decided is most important when it comes to the criteria set forth. So when it talks about the plan should be consistent with the, with the following criteria, it says each internal director, council, or uh, commissioner district shall be as nearly equal in population as possible to each and every other such district comprising the municipal, corporation, county, or special purpose district. B says each district shall be as compact as possible. C, each district shall consist of geographically contiguous area. D, uh, population may not be used for purposes of favoring or disfavoring any racial group or political party. And then E, to the extent feasible, if not inconsistent with the basic enabling legislation for the municipal corporation, county or the district or the district boundary shall coincide with existing recognized natural boundaries and shall to the extent possible preserve existing communities of related and mutual interest. So if we look at in order of priority from state law, number one, or excuse me, 4A, says each internal director, council, or commissioner district shall be as nearly equal in population as possible to each and every other such district. So equal in population, uh, easily the map that was recommended from the commission uh, is better than all of the other maps. Each district shall be as compact as possible. The recommended map is the best there. Each district shall consist of a geographically contiguous area. The best map there is the one that was recommended. When it comes to the population, data may not be used for purposes of favoring or disfavoring any racial group or political party. The recommended map does the best. To the extent feasible, if not inconsistent with the basic enabling legislation to the, exist, uh, to the extent possible, preserve existing communities of related and mutual interest. When it comes to neighborhood boundaries and neighborhood count, uh, uh, councils being kept whole. This was more a, a directive that um, people who took the, the survey had asked for, but it was not the most important thing they asked for. The first thing they asked for was minimal changes. When it comes to minimal changes, the map that was recommended is by far the best. Um, when we look through here, when we look at state law, according to state law, it is clearly Clearly the choice here to best follow state law of the maps that were given is the map that was recommended unanimously by a bipartisan diverse council of thought who, who thought through all the issues, wrestled with the issues, and they came up with the map that was recommended. Now, a couple other things I want to talk about. So when we talk about gerrymandering, right? Gerrymandering is actually a portmanteau of a couple words, right? So Elbridge Gerry famously in 1812 uh, in Boston uh, drew some districts to very much favor the Democratic Republican Party at the time. So that's Gerry. The mandarin comes from, uh, it looked like a salamander. And so if you put those two maps up next to each other, the reason why it looked like a salamander is because it curved to favor certain things. If you put those two maps up against each other and you ask, hey, which one is gerrymandered? 
90% of people are gonna say easily, this one right here is the one that's gerrymandered. And it's not even gonna be close. Any reasonable person who looks at the new district boundaries that were given are gonna be something they're going to be able to say, this one right here looks like it's been uh, finagled to, uh, to actually better rep or not better represent these districts, but to favor one political party. I mean, it, it seems pretty clear to me. When we're talking about the public outreach process, I, I absolutely love that when it comes to public outreach process, it is terrible public outreach. Every single time it's something that we don't like. And yet, we continue to use the same tools. If this is resulting in bad, bad public testimony, why do we continue to use SurveyMonkey? Why do we continue to hold public meetings if it's not getting us all the things that we want? I, I am honestly just so shocked uh, at this entire thing. Everybody had the same public notice. Everybody had the same thing, uh, had the same ability to do it. When it comes to petitions, when it comes to emails, when it comes to public testimony, you put any public testimony, any public outreach side to side, by far at multiples, the people asking for map one, uh, it's, it's heavily weighted in that direction. I am, I am frankly astounded that we continue to say that our public outreach is not doing good and we continue to do the same things, you know, expecting different results. I don't, I don't understand what's going on. And um, I, I mean, there's, there's plenty more reasons uh, why this should be there. I mean, there, there are several real issues uh, with the map that has been uh, presented. Um, I think I will finish with this and I'll probably have more to chime in later as we go along. But uh, I'll finish with, I think, I think this is the first time I've heard somebody say, God bless Daniel Walters. <laughs> He'll take it. <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. So I, I wanna bring up a few things. And I've said this, thanks for the folks in the um, audience that listen to me jibber jabber at them during our break. I appreciated being able to kind of open up. I want to remind people of um, the stadium project. If those of you that remember, it was how many years ago, three, four, four years ago, when there was big talk about where the stadium was going to go. And um, city council kind of got in the middle of it with the school district and the public, everybody was jibber jabbering about it. And so we said, let's put that out for a vote. Clearly, the vote came back that people wanted, the public vote wanted the stadium um, at Joe Albee. That's where they wanted that stadium. And where did that stadium end up? It ended up downtown. It's being constructed right now. So um, this isn't the first time, for, for those of you that um, are shocked and disappointed, I get it. I know how you feel because that's how I felt when the stadium got um, when we didn't listen to voters on that. Um, the second thing I wanna say, um, I've said this before, I was elected to serve constituents in District 3. Um, they don't care who I voted for for president. They don't care what my political leanings are. They care that their streets are plowed. They care that their garbage is picked up. They care that they know where to go when there's a problem. I have a huge issue. Um, in fact, I resent all of this discussion about political parties and political parties sending mass emails to tell people that, you know, you've got to, this is gerrymandering and we've got to do this. This is local government. We run um, with no party behind our names. There's no, I don't run as a Democrat or Republican. Um, and so the, some of those tactics that have been used to get people down here tonight, um, I, I resent them. I resent the letters that, that I've heard about that have gone out encouraging people that this is gerrymandering. Um, one of our council members who's a new council member who is um, the next generation that's going to lead our community and we've done nothing but, um, without saying his name, badmouth him and blame him for this whole process when I find that part of my responsibility up here is to mentor and to bring a next generation before the city to help make the community a better place to live. So I, I, I'm disappointed in that. Um, and, and finally, I'm, I'm just gonna say, 
I'm, I'm torn, this is hard for me because I care so much about my district. I care about the hundreds of emails that we've received that have said, we don't feel that this was fair, we don't feel that we were listened to. I can't go back to that redistricting group and say, let's start this over. But I have to stand up and go to my neighborhood council meetings and either say, I supported your 300 phone calls in favor of MAP2, or I didn't. So please give us some grace in knowing that we're all trying to do the best thing for the community and for the people that voted us into office. And it's a, it's a hard place to be sometimes. Finally, the way we treat each other. Um, I usually, you know, I was born and raised in this um, environment. I made some faces tonight that I know my mother in heaven was looking down at me and very disappointed because I made some faces that were not appropriate and I apologize. But I really hope that someday we can come in these chambers and we can be mad and we can, you know, want to stand up here and talk and, and go back and forth with council members, but we stop and we take a breath and we say, we've got to make this work together. We have got to treat each other with dignity and respect, whether we like each other or whether we disagree with each other. If we're going to face the problems that this city, like every other big city in, in this country is facing right now, and make the quality of life better for everybody in this community, we've got to work together. And shaming, and um, you know, I did it, and I apologize. I got up, I had to leave the room because I, I could feel myself getting worked up, and I apologize for that. We shouldn't be talking to each other the way we do, or even the, the facial expressions. I apologize for that. I thought it was me. <laughs> I thought you were making faces at me. No. I just really wish that when these types of issues come up that we could just show a little bit of, maybe we should serve wine during a meeting or something, I don't know. But just kind of a, hey, we appreciate you, we disagree. Um, but to point fingers and the gerrymandering topics and the letters and the face, I didn't see a Facebook posts. I'm not being, um, trying to undermine anything. I'm just listening to the people that voted me to represent them. So um, this is a tough one, and I, I was hoping we could maybe have some more time to think about other things we could do to, to get somewhere in the middle where people could be a little more comfortable with where we're at. But um, I just wanted you to know what was in my heart, and um, we'll take it from there. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah. Um, so a couple things, uh, I, hopefully I'll be brief. I guess my first thought is based on the, the population numbers from map number two, which is what we're considering right now for uh, a substitution, I really wonder whether this entire redistricting process was actually necessary. And I say that because the difference between the three districts before all of this began was a approximately 2,900 and 500, respectively. Um, meaning District 1 needed to gain about 2,900, um, and District 3 needed to gain about 500, District 2 needing to lose about the same. Um, but when you add up the differences, we now have uh, a difference between districts of 20, almost 2,700 for one, and 1,200 for another. So we've almost widened, made it a bigger gap between these, these districts um, based on, on this map. The map one does make it very, very tight, which I think is to the letter of the law what we're supposed to be doing. So, I mean, first and foremost, that is, I think, fundamental to all of this. So I, I don't actually think this entire process would have been necessary um, given this, this direction that we're going. Second, I have loved, I have really appreciated the dis redistricting process in Washington State as a whole. That same process was followed at the county. Obviously, our city has a slightly different, um, different process, but I think the idea of putting uh, four people essentially in a room, three in this case, uh, and making three of the four or a majority of them agree, two of the three agree, on, on something is, is a great way to create a, a bipartisan outcome, a, 
a centrist outcome, something that everybody can agree with. You know, we don't see politics uh, too much, uh, overtly anyway, uh, infest our state redistricting and even the county redistricting processes. Um, they tend to be above that because there has to be that high level of agreement between partisans. And that's sort of the idea here. And we got it. We had a unanimous decision of, of three appointees confirmed by this council, all three of those members. We had a unanimous decision on map one. They excluded um, several other maps, as we heard, map two um, included, uh, because they felt that map one, uh, for a variety of reasons, met closely the, the letter of the law. Um, what I would say is, obviously, I, I believe we should respect what they have put forward. I think it makes the most sense. It's the simplest, and it does create fewer divisions. Um, but I, I think um, two points I want to make it, on that note as well is, you know, the numbers as they break down will continue to, I believe, uh, result in District 1 uh, having the lowest turnout in Spokane. We, we currently do. We have for a long time. Um, we have the lowest population, the lowest turnout, and this keeps us with the lowest population and likely, as a result, the lowest turnout. I don't think that's fair. I think we want to see higher turnout, more activity, more engagement from District 1, and I'm not sure that this accomplishes that. But the other thing, and we've heard a lot about the neighborhoods being divided, I just could not disagree more with this idea that uh, having only two representatives instead of four makes you more powerful. I disagree. For those who can count, four out of seven is a majority. That's how you get stuff done up here. And if you have four people representing you that you get to talk to at your, your neighborhood meetings every month uh, or that is going to respond to you because you're a neighborhood council, you're powerful. You've got strength. East Central is one of our strongest neighborhoods because of that. And I am in no way inclined to take that power away from them. They are already saddled with so much right now. Uh, I'm not going to get into all of that, but we know it's a lot that they are dealing with that is on their plates and is wrecking havoc um, in that neighborhood. And so I do not want to penalize them. And it feels to me like that's what happens. It takes away their power. It takes away that strength. I want East Central to be really freaking strong. And I don't think this accomplishes that. So I'm not in favor of it for that. But here's my suggestion. I think there's a compromise that could be had. Maybe you agree, maybe you don't. But I'm going to throw it out there. What if, because I believe that the district, the map two that was put out there is a little bit more appropriate for that mid uh, decennial uh, uh, consideration. It's bigger changes, it's different changes. It's, it's really making some, some drastic, or not drastic, that's, that's too far, but, but some really big movements that, um, that I think map one does not do. And so what I would suggest is what if we move forward with map one as proposed, create a working group that's gonna work between uh, 2023 and 2025, when we can pass those um, mid-decennial uh, uh, changes, and they would bring forward recommendations on what those map, what that map or map should look like. They can also bring forward perhaps uh, recommendations in working with neighborhoods on modifications to neighborhood boundaries. Those happen from time to time, and that's another thing that hasn't come up is how easily neighborhoods can change, new neighborhoods can be created. They could bring back recommendations to tie all this together. It could be a, a standing committee on boundaries. And I think they could come back with some really good recommendations, charter amendments too, perhaps, related to this. But I think they could come back and we could just have a much more thoughtful process to make those bigger, grander changes that some folks want to have happen right now. So I'm gonna throw that out there as a proposal. Uh, obviously, if we adopt map two, that can't happen because we can't roll back, as our uh, attorney mentioned. So if uh, map two it is not adopted, then I would work to put this forward, bring it back for our consideration on November 7th. I think this is a compromise. I think it's a way that we can work together uh, and, and come up with some consensus that would work for everybody. So I'll leave it there. Councilmember Kinney. And, and I would, just to respond to that, I don't like to debate with each other here, but I think we can do that anyway. I think the whole neighborhood council system needs to be looked at very carefully and if it's working, if it's not. Some neighborhoods are dark right now, they're not meeting. But we can do that anyway. And I think what, actually, I, I always defer to Councilmember Wilkerson when it comes to East Central. That is not, I represent East Central, but I don't live there. Councilmember Wilkerson does. And I, I don't think four council members represent East Central well. And I would defer to you to talk about that. I don't think any of the three other 
people on that should have any business talking about that, quite frankly. So I, I'd like to hear from you on that. Well, I have grown up in East Central, Fourth and Altamont, uh, Edison, Libby, LC. Having four council members in East Central has been challenging because of the division of Sprague. There's representation north of the freeway and there's representation south of the freeway. And we are not always in alignment as by what happened in the spring over public safety. That was one more thing that divided the East Central neighborhood that has yet to truly be addressed as we go forward. So I am in the neighborhood. Uh, I hear the voices of the people of the neighborhood, especially voices that are not able to be in this environment, who can't come down the city council and spend three hours, or who have the time to be doing thought exchange, or have the ability to do thought exchange. And so those are some definite challenges uh, that the East Central neighborhood has. But again, I put forth this new ordinance because all those neighborhoods are in District 2. And they have said they want to keep their neighborhoods intact. And they didn't say anything about being Democrat or Republican. Never came up. It was people, people, people. When I got emails, it wasn't about their party. It was about their neighborhoods and keeping neighborhoods together. And so I have to account to people in District 2 and hear their voices and represent them. So that is my position going forward on that. Thank you. Anyone else before I weigh in and take a voice? For, I do yeah, have a question. Ahead. So the, the difference in numbers in population, or is there anything legal we need to understand about that? It's within 5%. My, my understanding from Assistant Attorney Piccolo, when he, the advice that he gave the commission was what we heard from Rick Freelander, that they had to be between 74,421 and 78,237. That qualifies as eligible under state law, but you can go ahead and tell us. Yeah, through this entire process, I don't think there was ever any specific percentage okay. tossed out by state law or through the local process. Mm -hmm. So we relied on what we have seen from the state redistricting, the county redistricting, taking, taking that, that lead to keep it within that 5% has been the practice from what we have seen. But those numbers that Rick pointed out, that I'll just lose the 74,000 to 78,000, that was within the I believe percentage. so, yes. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. All right, well, I'll have a few words, and then we'll take, it's kind of anticlimactic because we don't get to press the buttons. It's just a voice vote, just on a memo. We're not voting on the whole thing tonight, but I appreciate it. So the first thing I do want to say is I really do appreciate all the interest and participation from people uh, on the council and the audience here and who's uh, participated previously. I think the, where I start is the process it's, a, it's different at the city than it is at the county and the state. And I think people forget that. On the, the county and the state, that's a partisan process. There are rep Republican representatives, Democrat representatives, and then a chair who doesn't vote, and they work for consensus between the parties. It's all about the parties. And at the city, we're nonpartisan. It's not about the parties. It's not, I don't, the majority of the council members, when they present their maps, they didn't know who lived in what district or not. Uh, we one, I think one commission member, um, one of the elected ones, mentioned it once, but no one else with that. So that's different than the state process. The other thing that's different is that in the state and the uh, county process, the commission makes the final choice. They make the final choice. In our process, under our ordinance, under state law, the commission makes some recommendations, and then council has to make the final process, so uh, the final decision. So it's different. So for people to say, oh, my God, you know, you're overruling the commission. Well, no, the commission's advisory, uh, and they brought us, they did the work, they brought us ideas, they, they brought us that. But it's our vote at the end, and a little bit to Council Member Stratton's point, I, I feel the same way, is that at the end of the day, I have to decide, well, what do I think is best for the city? Uh, and I have to vote. I can't just say, well, the commission said that, even though I disagreed with it. Um, but um, 
I, and I do want to just make a point from where I sit on it as council president. Uh, I ran my last election citywide, so the districts, you know, it, it doesn't impact me uh, if I was to run again. Uh, and I know that whatever district, if you change votes from one to another, it's impacting uh, all the districts. So whatever you do, one way or the other, potentially, whatever impact you think, it's going to hurt or help other people uh, potentially in the future. Um, I do want to say, though, that we at City Council have had a history, as long as I've been on, of deferring greatly to um, community advisory boards and commissions. We do. That's, I would say that's our rule of thumb, is that we uh, almost always... Uh, go with um, that both to reward them and particularly if they have some expertise and information uh, that's helpful, uh, we do that. But not always. There are times when we say, nope, we, we're making the decision and we have to do what we think is right. Um, and um, I'll get to what I think about that um, at the end. But I wanted to go back to the RCW, and obviously I'm not the attorney for the city, but when I looked at those laws, it didn't, there was a, a contention that whichever one the legislature put first was the most important, and that's not how I read it. What I read it, uh, the, there were several factors that were read. We heard all of them, and they did not say, actually, this is the most important, this is the second, this is the third, and one of the challenges for the um, commission, the voting members of the commission, was they didn't have that guidance of to what it, it, it's there, and um, the last condition that was read, which is, thou shalt keep uh, communities of interest together, which means you sh shall not divide them. Uh, the way I read the law is that you want to do as much as you can in all those areas all the time. So you do want them close to each other, but you're not going to get down to one apart or ten apart or even a hundred apart uh, if it means dividing a community of interest, if it means doing an actual gerrymander where you do some thin thing all around, the fact that the lines are not straight, perpendicular, like squares, that does not make it gerrymandering. Um, so that's how I read the law, is that the legislature um, potentially wisely to give flexibility to each community to design the districts how they want, gave us these factors and they didn't say this is the top, this is the second or the third. You're supposed to do all of them at once. And the commissioners worked on that and as has been mentioned many times, the number one feedback that we got in the process before it got more political was don't divide the neighborhood councils and those communities of interest. And the commissioners worked on that. And you heard tonight that three different commissioners essentially proposed MAP2. And the reason that they did was to preserve those neighborhood, neighborhoods staying in the same district. And one of those, you know, MAP2 was uh, recommended unanimously by all three voting commissioners as one of the four possibilities that should be looked at. So the first work they did was identify what the interests of the community were, and they clearly identified keeping communities of interest together, then gave us four options. Uh, one of which three of them had endorsed, and all three of them endorsed all four options. And those were the options that were really presented to the public. Uh, so all four of those options met the population range that Mr. Piccolo mentioned of within 5%. Uh, and they had different jobs. They did different ways of how they divided or not divided, whether they used the river, whether they used the bluff. Uh, they tried to do all those things. And at the end of the day, uh, they chose, of the four they had already approved, in general, unanimously, they chose uh, map one was their top choice based on their perspective and what they um, saw. Um, and it was a good process. And I, I don't really have any complaints with the, the outreach. We could always do better. We only do this every once every 10 years, and we learned a lot about it. If I was doing this next year, I would have some recommendations for all of us. Um, under our ordinance, the council president always sits on that. Uh, under our ordinance, the city council appoints a council member. Uh, council member Zappone was appointed by all of us, I think unanimously, to be our representative on that. And his job was to be a voice for council members. I saw my job to be more of an advisor, and I don't, I mean, you can, some of you may have watched the hearings. I don't think I particular put my thumb on any particular map. I tried to answer questions as best I could. Uh, and provide resources. Um, I thought the p 
situation did get very political once uh, campaigns started sending out emails and encouraging people to vote in the online survey and come to the meeting with you know, three very specific talking points, but people are free to do that. That's, that's part of the process. Um, but here is why I am more interested in map two than map one. So map two was the only map that kept the council's districts together, the neighborhood council districts together. So everyone tried to do it. They thought it was important. That was the only way they could do it. The numbers are a little wider between the districts, but they're still within the parameters. But, and again, this comes to where I, di I differ than uh, the voting commission members, and that is I've served, I served about four years as a council member for District 2. And in that time, I realized a little bit contrary to Council Member Cathcart's experience that those council, neighborhood council districts that had uh, four council members actually seemed to get less attention than the ones that had two. And the reason is, I think, and this is just based on my experience from when I first joined the council, it was a little unclear to me who was supposed to take the lead to take care of those councils. And what would happen is that since there were four council members, at least when I was doing it, we tended to think, oh, the other ones will go and, and I not go. And also just understanding, like, who's, who are they supposed to go to? And they were confused about it. And I know for a fact that in my first couple years, I rarely went to Riverside and I rarely went to West Hills. I, I, I thought West Hills was in District 3, essentially, uh, even though technically I knew it was. And then, you know, once I realized that was there. East Central always, the bulk of East Central is in District 2. That seemed clear to me. But I was listening closely to the neighborhood council leaders tonight, and they all seem to say they like the two. That's easier for them to corral council members and to get ownership, and my experience is that council members did a better job of taking care of their districts when there was only two. So uh, some people, again, I, I, I still do remember the person that spoke at the last meeting that said, oh, I'm more loyal to my precinct than my neighborhood council. That is not my experience. And I think preserving those communities of interest uh, is the, probably the most important thing in this, assuming we can generally be within the population range of each other and generally they are compact and not curving all around, you know, like a snake's tail up into someone else's district and things like that. I didn't see that in any of the four maps, actually. So I'm going to support the amendment to map two and like Councilmember Kinnear, uh, in five years, if we want, we can use that time, if we want to change the neighborhood things and, and do that for a different kind of contour, uh, geographic or neighborhood, then uh, that's, that's fine. I, most of us probably won't be here, but hopefully uh, future councils uh, will remember that. Mm -hmm. So, I yes, just, Councilmember yes. Ringel. All right. Like I said, I'd probably jump back in again. I appreciate that we're talking about the neighborhood council leaders and the emphasis on East Central. The East Central chair of that neighborhood council has said he actually appreciates having four city council members because he feels he is and East Central is best represented by having more um, representation. Um, for the record, when we're talking about congressional districts or districts and population, congressional districts in the state of Washington are within 12 people. We're talking in close to a million people in these districts, they're within 12. So when we talk about getting population close, this isn't thousands of people in these districts, it's 12 in districts of hundreds of thousands, close to a million people. And uh, I, I am also surprised uh, to hear some of us discouraging community engagement by interested parties. I, I'm, I am really surprised by that to say, well, because a local political party got involved. We have to throw out the entire process. It suddenly got political. Politics just means relating to the public. Everything dealing with public policy is inherently political by definition. And so to say the process has been political, everything we do is political by definition. And since you were kind of responding to me, I just want to say, uh, as I said earlier, yeah. I think it's great that everyone participated. Yeah. Yeah. I think it changed uh, the conversation in the room, but I, like everyone should do it, the more the better. And I do have to note that if my understanding of the East Central chair does not live in East Central, uh, but uh, uh, the East Central people who did, who do live there and testified tonight overwhelmingly seem to, to be that, but um, we'll probably continue to agree to disagree. And with that, there's, so it's a voice vote to 
uh, substitute the version of the ordinance that was circulated today that includes map two as the attachment instead of map one and some other minor language changes. Uh, if you're in favor of the substitution, say aye. 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 If you're opposed, say nay. 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 If you're abstaining, say abstain. Abstain. Okay. All right. The ayes have it. It's amended. We'll get point out. Of, point of order. Yep. I thought we couldn't abstain from votes unless we had a personal interest in the, in the process. You, well, you can abstain. You can request the council member give their basis, and I, I'm the decider of that. But council member Zappone, do you want to offer your basis? for? Yeah, I mean, there's just been a lot of talk about me in this process, so I just wanted to remove myself from the process. The chair accepts that, subject to being overruled by a majority. Um, um, all right, uh, so we'll get that word out, and we went, and we'll be back on the 7th for any more testimony and a final vote. And with that, we're adjourned. Please say, oh, and we're past 9.30, so we're not doing open forum this time. Uh, as I predicted, still open? and please mm -hmm. take garage. care of yourself. And if you can't take care of someone else, we're adjourned. It's open late now. Is it? Movies now.